Hello, everyone. This is Michael Gibbs again. Happy Saturday, and I hope you're having a wonderful time. This is going to be day five of our free AWS Certified Solution Architect 2022 Bootcamp. It's a real honor and a real privilege to be with you here all today. So this is day five of our free AWS course, our, our AWS Certified Solution Architect Associate Bootcamp. It's been really, really great for the first four days. We've gone over a lot of AWS technologies. We actually did a BGP session for people to learn BGP based upon what was going on in the industry. Um, we had a lot of open dialogues. Yesterday, we brought in some tech recruiters to help you find your first cloud architect job. Yes, we've done a lot of labs throughout the week, uh, which I think have been an incredible good time um, for all. And, you know, every one of the people that have been here, you know, we've had people from country and country and country, which makes me really happy. If we can spread the cloud computing message, if we can train people for the best cloud computing jobs, it makes us feel really happy. So the reason we create this content is we've looked around, we looked at all the certification training that was out there, and we could not find anything that we found to be really good at helping you get cloud hired. So we wanted to do this as free training for you all. Today, we're gonna have a lot more fun things to go over in our training systems today. We're gonna to be going over a lot of the AWS services and some more of the AWS security services because security is absolutely critical. So this is something I'm super happy about to do with you guys today. If you guys are here and you guys are ready, let me know by typing hashtag cloud hired in the chat box and then I know you guys are gonna be here. And after you guys let me know with the cloud hired, if you guys want to keep me going in the direction you want, that is great. You know, I had a lot of fun yesterday with you guys. We were going down the standard path for the Certified Solution Architect Associate. And then you guys wanted more. So we went into IAM depth of the level of the Certified Solution Architect Professional. And I am happy to do this absolutely for you guys anytime. Whole message, the whole point of training is to get cloud hired. That's why we're not focused on certification. We like certifications to help you guys get a cloud architect interview or a solution architect interview. But what gets you hired, what gets you that cloud architect job, that whole cloud hired concept is really a great degree of technical competency, a high level of emotional intelligence, executive communication skills, executive presence, ROI modeling, business acumen, and everything. But we know this certification is really important for lots of people. We know we have a cloud architect versus a cloud engineer. We cloud architects are designers and cloud engineers are builders. So we've tried to give you some AWS labs during the week. We've tried to give you some AWS tips, whether you're an engineer or an architect. And we've brought in lots of people, done lots of question and answer sessions. So without further ado, all you guys that I've seen have, and girls have typed hashtag cloud hired, which means I know you're there. I know you're having fun. And that makes us great. I'm also going to do some housekeeping. I'll probably do it two or three times throughout the session. If you enjoy our content, please hit the like button. Please subscribe and hit the bell so you get informed of every time we come online. We're going to be doing a lot more professional development. I'm going to try and come at you a couple times a week with some of the latest and breaking changes in the technology industry. We don't have the time to do it every day, but we're going to really try and you know give you guys much more so you guys can benefit from our 20 some years of experience. So let's go back to some AWS Certified Solution Architect Associate training. So now let's talk about security. Now, while we're on the discussion of security, there's nothing that's more important from security than keeping bad things, bad actors, bad people, bad system out of your network. So how do you do that? At the edge of your network, you need to use something called a firewall. Here's what a firewall does. It keeps bad things out of your system. It allows your traffic to go out to the internet and come back, but it keeps everything out of your system that you don't specifically permit. So when we're gonna talk about firewalls with AWS, you're really gonna have two options. Option one is to go to the marketplace, and when you're in the marketplace, you can get really big, really good, really robust enterprise-grade solutions from Cisco, from Palo Alto, from Fortinet, really big enterprise grade security. And when you're in a big environment and you're consulting with the world's biggest organizations like me, you're gonna use a lot of the marketplace. You're gonna use them for 
firewalls, on all kinds of cool appliances. But when you're working on a lot of organizations or smaller organizations or people that don't need that big enterprise grade security, you're gonna be using the cloud native services. And here we're gonna talk about WAF. I just want you guys to understand there are two kinds of firewalls. There are these industrial firewalls that we've been all using. They're typically made from Checkpoint, Palo Alto, Cisco, Fortinet, or, and even sometimes Juniper Networks has some. And if it's not made by them, you're gonna be using the AWS Shield, I mean the AWS WAF, which we're gonna talk about. But let's really remember this. Firewalls are for perimeter security. They keep stuff out of your network. How do you keep your systems secure? Well, you don't give routes to people that don't need it and they can't reach it. If you don't have a road, you can't go drive down the road. Then part of it, what we'll be doing is we'll have firewalls, we'll have IDS IPS systems, we'll have network ACLs, which we talked about, security groups, adding host-based firewalls, you name it, we will be using it. We will be using a whole lot of uh, technology to really promote a layered approach to security. But right now we're talking about AWS native things and we're gonna talk about WAF. So what is WAF? AWS WAF is a web application firewall. It's designed to protect against common attacks. So it's gonna look at HTTP, HTTPS requests for common exploits, and if so, it'll block it. WAF can control your CloudFront distribution and Amazon API gateway, a REST API, or load balance request. WAF, because it's a firewall, will block you know, connections at the edge locations long before they get to your network. So basically, WAF controls who can access your system, just like any other firewall. WAF is cloud native, web application firewall is part of the AWS cloud native security services. Now, because it's a firewall, it enables you to get relatively granular and control access to your resources. Whether you do it with what's called like an access list, but an access list on a firewall is basically stateful, even though on the router or the subnets are typically not. You can create rules or rule groups. Realistically speaking, you create a policy. Traffic from this subnet may pass through the firewall and come in. Traffic from this subnet is blocked. That's what you're dealing with. with, with. So typically speaking, firewall at the edge of your network, people could try and come in, try and hack you. They are blocked. They are blocked. They are blocked. And if anything breaches your firewall in an ideal world, you have an intrusion detection, intrusion prevention system to do that. But right now we're just talking about firewalls. So now that we've done this, let's talk about, you know, how you would use WAF. Very simply, you enable WAF on your application or device. You create a policy that says you're allowed in versus you're not allowed in. When traffic hits the firewall, the WAF pop will analyze your policy and say allowed or denied. And if a cat attack is occurring, you know, anytime you're dealing with firewalls, you can create new firewall rules and it'll stop it. Now, if you're dealing with a next generation firewall, like the kind of great stuff from Palo Alto or Cisco or Fortinet, they can actually look at patterns of behavior and literally create access control lists on their own. Reset TCP connections, do a lot of the cool things that IDS IPS systems. So realize with new and modern firewalls, the new stuff, the next generation firewalls, they are self-healing. So just give you a little bit of information on firewall. So let's look at this in this situation. Uh, we're going to look at it, you know, in a couple different ways, architecturally speaking. So you could apply WAF, your cloud front distribution, your application load balancers, your gateways. Basically, what's going on is you're setting a policy, and it'll just either filter your traffic and monitor what's going on. Now, let's look at it as part of a more holistic sort of environment. So... You know, this is showing you just the AWS Cloud Native Services. In reality, you may actually have a lot more. But in this particular case, what we're actually referring to is you can see we've got our Internet Gateway, we've got our load balancers, we've got our AWS WAF, which is a firewall protecting the things behind the load balancer. And after we actually have that, what we actually have with is a network ACL protecting the subnets, a security group that's now actually um, taking, take, that's actually controlling what's going on here. Now, something interesting just happened to my slides, so bear with me while I try and fix this for you. I am not Mr. Microsoft or Mr. PowerPoint by any stretch of the imagination, but, you know, let's make sure we get this fixed for you. I think we got it fixed there a little bit more. Let's try and make this look a little more elegant for you. Something happened with the slides. I don't really think we know how, but uh, hopefully that gives you what you need over here. Um, maybe if I go that way. That looks like we're a lot closer to where we want to be. So let's go 
back so I can. So let's work on this. So now, um, actually, bear with me one second while I try and figure out what's going on with my view on PowerPoint. So let's talk about distributed denial of service attacks. As soon as I. What is a distributed denial of service attack? A distributed denial of service attack is when a hacker hacks into a bunch of systems on the internet and then launches an attack on you. So in this particular example, here's what it's going to look like. We're going to have an attacker that takes control of a server or his server or her server. Then they infect a lot of systems along the way. And after they infect a lot of systems along the way, they basically take control of these environments. So that's realistically speaking how a hacker actually will attack environments. Bear with me. I'm really struggling with my PowerPoint right now. I like to get new slides so I can talk to you. And I can actually, okay, good. Okay, got back, got access to the slides. Like I said, I am not Mr. PowerPoint. Um, it's not who I am. I've been designing systems forever. Des writing them up, designing them, sending them to a graphics team. And after I send them to a graphics team, they all get beautified and indesigned and things like that. But, you know, when you're making your own things. So how do you stop a distributed denial of service tech? So I told you, here's what an attack is. You take a system, you attack a bunch of other systems, and you use those other systems to attack you. Here's what's tr realistically speaking going. I want you to think about this for, so you understand the attack. If you've got a web page that can handle 5,000 web requests per second, and all these servers hit that web page 100,000 times a second for the web request, the server can't meet the needs. So 5,000 capabilities, 10,000, 15,000, 20,000 web requests, the fake web requests from the hacker overwhelm the server. Now, when a server is this busy, basically it can't serve the web page to anybody else because it's busy dealing with the hacker's attacks. And more importantly, if the server gets hit hard enough and maybe the oh, buffers overflow some memory buffers, the attacker can then take access to the server, escalate privileges and do damage to the server, change files to the server, snoop on you, and in some cases you don't even know. So these DDoS attacks where you take one system and use a lot of systems to hack into things, this is a big deal. And you've got to work really hard to do it. So what do you do? You use a layered approach. So first, at the edge of our network, we're going to use some kind of DDoS protection, which we're going to talk about. Then behind that, we do a firewall. And behind the firewall, we're going to do an intrusion detection, intrusion prevention system. And behind that, we're going to have some network ACLs. We're going to have some security groups. On our servers, we'll have uh, host-based firewalls. We'll add ETA malware protection. We'll disable unnecessary services. This is part of the process of locking down your systems. But there are also DDoS services, which don't believe in for a moment are going to stop DDoS attacks, but they are going to help. They are part of the process. It takes a lot of layers. And there's DDoS protection, which you can get from Cloudflare, which is helpful, from Akamai, the content delivery network, or from AWS, attached to their content delivery network or other things. AWS has a good DDoS service. It's very robust, and it's called Shield. And we'll talk about Shield. Basically, Shield is a DDoS protection service. And there's going to be two versions of Shield we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about Shield and Shield Advanced. Now, these two services are really good because basically Shield itself basically is free if you use WAF and it's extra protection. I'd prefer Shield Advanced and we'll talk about that why in a minute. But the point is, is even the free Shield if you believe what the documentation says from AWS, uh, that 96% of most common DDoS attacks are thwarted by the basic shield. And whether it be a SYNAC attack, a reflection attack, an HTTP slow, lead, 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 a slow read, these are your basic, more common attacks, and AWS Shield Standard does it. Now, the thing to remember with Shield, Stara, shield is it's not next generation. It is not adaptive. It's static, meaning... You set the policy, and Shield will protect you. Old firewalls are static. You set the policy, and they protect you according to the policy. Next generation firewalls can look at patterns of behavior and say, this is no good, and stop it. So AWS Shield Advance gets closer to what you find in a next generation firewall, and it's quite a good DDoS service. Basically, what happens is Shield Advance is adaptive. 
just like a modern firewall. So Shield Advance will basically look for patterns of behavior. This doesn't look right. This doesn't look right. Deploy an ACL, reset a TCP connection, something cool, automatically on their own. And when you're dealing with Shield Advanced, now you're getting you know, some help because you get visibility for your layer three, your layer four, your layer seven attacks. You really get to see what's going on. It's a great service. And if you've got the Shield Advanced, you've got customers that are going to even have access to a 24 by 7 DDoS response team, assuming the customer has business or enterprise support. So this realistically means is if you opt for Shield Advanced and you're using with AWS, and I strongly recommend you do, if you're using AWS and integrate this into your systems, especially with CloudFront, which is a great content delivery network, if you've got a problem, you've got AWS support. You always want to be in a position with support. These vendors like AWS, these vendors like GCP, these vendors like Azure, they've got some really good technically competent people working for them. And no matter how much we think we know a cloud provider service, they know their service is much better because they know all the inner workings. They know the weaknesses of their systems, the strengths of their systems, the breaking points in their systems, and how to work with their systems better than anybody else. Now, they may not know other people's systems as well, but any vendor will know their systems. If you go to Azure, they will know Azure like nobody else in the world. If you go to Cisco, they will know Cisco gear better than anybody else in the world. If you make the product yourself, and you have access to the people that made the product, and you know exactly what goes into making it, you will know much, much, much more than someone that's an outsider that read a book or took a training course. Because if you make it yourself, you know everything. So remember that when you need support, it's always good to have it. Now we'll talk about um, three quick services. They're typically speaking found only on the Certified Solution Architect Professional, but I want you to know what they are just in case. There's one service called Amazon Guard Duty, and basically this is an Amazon service that monitors your AWS accounts, and Guard Duty will look at CloudTrail, DNS, VPC flow logs, and it's gonna look for patterns of behavior that don't feel right. And if it sees anything that it doesn't like, it'll send you a CloudWatch event. So. In a way, this is like some rudimentary basic intrusion detection. The next service is something called Amazon Inspector. And this is an automated security assessment service that helps improve the security and compliance of your applications. That's it. Amazon Inspector automatically assesses your applications for exposures, vulnerabilities, or deviations from best practices. And after Amazon Inspector performs its initial assessment, it provides a detailed list of security findings, which is prioritized by level of security. Of course, it's automated. So when it's automated, you know some of these suggestions are going to be great, and some of them are going to be all over the place. So it gives you a list of things that are not optimal, and then you can basically evaluate. Yes, fix this. No, don't fix this. This is terrific. I got to tell you, in my years, I used to run sniffers, their protocol analyzers. I'd stick it on the land in different places just to see what I could find. And you'd be amazed what you can find. Systems that don't belong there, unpatched systems, non-compliant systems. So Amazon Inspector is kind of like a sniffer, meaning it's not a sniffer where you're looking at packets, but it helps you get information to determine what's compliant and not compliant. This is great. You want to know what's on your systems. Along with this, there's another AWS security service called Amazon Macy. And this is a fully managed data security and privacy, privacy service that uses machine learning and pattern matching to discover and to discover and protect what's going on with your sensitive data. Basically, Macy automatically provides an inventory of your buckets, including a list of unencrypted buckets, publicly accessible buckets, and buckets with shared outside your organization. Very important. 16% of all cloud attacks happen from misconfigured S3 buckets. So you've got some automation checking. It's great. So Macy will look at it, and then it'll apply a machine learning and a pattern matching technique to the buckets you specify to identify you if a sensitive data or any important data is out there. So it's kind of a nice feature that they've given you with AWS Macy. Now let's talk about the service catalog. I want you to picture two environments. Environment one. Everything that you deploy is deployed methodically and in the best interest of the organization. Optimal, perfect. I want you to really look at production. You deploy everything that's supposed to be there 
Somebody else at their desk to play something and doesn't tell anybody. Somebody else to play something. There's an outage and a bunch of people make a change during the outage and don't notify anybody. This happens, this happens, this happens. The next thing you realize, you've got systems, they've got thousands of servers, you don't even know about it. Routers all over the place with WAN links to things you don't know about. Routing protocols that are not functioning optimally, giving you routing loops just like we just saw on Facebook. Um, basically what happens, these systems get really complicated. They get complicated beyond the point where somebody actually knows what to do, and then they make configuration errors and it happens, not because the configuration is challenging, because the person doesn't have access or knowledge of everything. So that's reality. So AWS does have a system to help you identify things that aren't supposed to be there. And that's called the service catalog. Basically what happens is you create a catalog of approved services, whether it be machine images, whether it be servers, software, databases, and application architectures. Only approved services. You specify this ahead of time. And what it'll look like is you create a catalog of approved services and user goes to the catalog, they kick off like a CloudFormation template and they deploy only what's allowed. So seriously, think about that. You can compete people from doing things they're not supposed to with the service catalog. That is really cool. Because like I said, you will find stuff that's not supposed to be there. And when you find stuff that's not supposed to be there, the stuff that's not supposed to be there causes all kinds of problems for you. So don't make it a problem. Know what's there and only let your people deploy ideal, perfected, lockdown services. And that's what the service catalog's for. And the service catalog is usually a great idea. While we're at it, let's talk about the last security service we'll talk about, which is the Systems Manager Parameter Store. Again, I don't know who thinks of these names. Now, the Systems Manager Parameter Store is another component of your strong security posture. Here's what's great about it. It enables you secure storage of passwords, database strings, and licenses. These are the things where if, you, if we're compromised, your systems are a problem. So it will look, it's a way to deal with your passwords your database strings, and your software license keys. AWS will help you with a place to store it, and it's called the Systems Manager Parameter Store. And it offers basically a hosted, serverless, scalable environment for storing your password, keys, API keys, license codes, those kind of things. So the way this works is for extremely sensitive information, you put it in the parameter store in an encrypted environment. And in this manner, your code is separated from your passwords, You've got a means to audit things easier and you can track your password usage. So the system parameter store will basically scan your instances or your virtual machines and report policy violations. So now you know these are the AWS services that are available for security. So next section, and it's a long section, is gonna be AWS services. And there's a lot of them. and We're gonna spend some time with each one of them. So prior to doing this, Let's see if there's any questions from the audience because I want to make sure we get to them. Chris, are there any questions from the audience you want to bring up on screen before we move to the new topic? Yes. Are you looking at StreamYard or YouTube? I'm going to be looking at StreamYard in one second. Okay, I'm looking at StreamYard. MW Muru, what is the best industry practice using WAF going to the marketplace or both? This is a case by cases, MW Murio. If you, as a general rule, if you've got a really strong organization that needs real enterprise grade environments, you're going to be going to the marketplace. You're going to have VPN users, for example, lots of VPN remote access users. It's going to be a lot easier using the, the auto VPN technologies that Cisco has to take in your users, add them into BGP and promote your routing than anything available from AWS. When you're dealing with the company like Cisco or Checkpoint, I want you to think about this. You basically have thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of employees. A company like Palo Alto, for example, will have had our, an incredible number of the best security architects in the world and the best security developers. And all they do are make firewalls, for example. I'm exaggerating the concept a little bit. They do more. But when you deal with a company like Checkpoint that's made security software and that's their whole business and they've been doing it day in and day out for 30 years. Cisco's been doing the same with their firewalls. They have 30 years 
and thousands of developers focused on security from the beginning. So AWS hasn't been around that long. Great company, love what they do. AWS does a little of a lot of things. Checkpoint does nothing other than security for 30 years. Who do you think has a better product for these environments? Who do you think's got more robust? When you deal with Cisco, when you deal with a router, you're dealing with what you have access to, to 4 million routes, basically 800,000 routes from five ISPs, no big deal on a Cisco router. When you connect to AWS, you have 100 routes. It's not that AWS isn't awesome, they are. You gotta remember, they have to do a lot of things. So what is a jack of all trades? A master of none. So if you get these things from the marketplace, of course you can get a better, more robust service than any cloud provider can give you because that's all these other services do. So if you're looking for inexpensive, quick, simple to deploy, WAF is your awesome firewall. If you're dealing with an organization that's got extreme security requirements and lots of remote access employees, and they want to use the next generation firewalls that self heal and adapt to things going on around them, which most big global organizations are, they're going to go to the marketplace. They are not going to use the cloud native service. I hope I answered your question with that. Manesh, what is the difference between a WAF and a NACL? Okay, good question. A web application firewall is used to keep people out of your systems, and network ACL is used to keep people out of your subnets. A real firewall or WAF in certain cases is adaptive. It's going to look at a pattern behavior and say, I don't like this and block it and stop it. And network ACL cannot. A firewall is stateful. If their data comes from inside the network out to the internet, your traffic will be allowed back because the firewall is maintaining state or tracking your connection. With network ACLs, there's no tracking. So firewalls, much more robust protection much more we're monitoring with the question and firewalls keep people out of all your systems network acls protect the subnet afri p question what can we do about the actual trend that modern malware is being written in new age programming languages like go julia and the firewall ids can so afri p what's going on is the new next generation firewalls can actually know this in fact a lot of times the best new firewalls will actually take the code, they'll spin up a virtual machine on that firewall, they will test the code before they even allow it on the network. So that's why we're using networking, I, that's why we're talking about next generation firewalls as the means to lock this down and not the WAF and not the basic traditional firewalls. WAF is great, I'm not against WAF, I love it. But I'm just saying that you, know, depend, you have to architect based upon the needs of your client. Abigail Marks, can bots create DDoS attack? Well. You gotta remember, AI in of itself is not that smart. A human can write the code, or the human could even write a machine learning algorithm to go infect other things, and I guess you could call them bots. But basically, a human decides to take this malicious attack, and whether they create a bot that launches the attack or they do it manually, it's really one of the same. But yes, humans can create bots that can launch a DDoS attack, absolutely. SM7, can I specify what services each Grohl is allowed to access? Well, SM7, it's 100% up to you as the, as, the, as the architect. You design who you think should talk to whom, and then the cloud engineer will put those things into the firewall for you or your cloud security engineer. So it's, that's up to you and me on the policy that we create for our customers. Derek, is the systems manager parameter store only used by root user or can it be used by all users? Um, it can be used by other users, but in generally speaking, you need administrative privileges to launch virtual machines. So definitely root user, definitely administrators. There may be a policy direct to connect other users. I've only set these things up to basically work with, you know, systems admins because they're the only people that I want actually launching systems in the first place. So good question there, Derek. Lightning DDD1. Where do you use WAF and Shield, security groups, network ACLs, load balancers, cloud fund? Okay. So I guess that's a pretty good question. Are you guys trying to tell me you want to see some architecture uh, that's outside of certifications? If you're telling me you want to learn cloud security architecture, let me know. I'll walk through a generic example of what an organization would do. Let me know in the following. If you're joining the content, smack that like button. 
Um, and if you want me to actually walk you through to how to do that, I will do it, but it's gonna take about 10 minutes. So let me know. If you want cloud security architecture, let me know and I'll go do it. Mike, I'm going to answer a question before you get to that. Okay, you what's go. that? Answer this one before you get to that. I can't really do how that. Reliable or pro how reliable are products from third parties in the marketplace? How reliable are products from the third parties in the marketplace? Um, it depends on the product that you actually get. If you get something from Cisco or Palo Alto, it'll be the most reliable product in the world um, and extremely good. Now, the only problem we have is when we go to the marketplace is normally speaking, you go to Cisco, you got a firewall. It's a high availability device. You go to uh, Palo Alto, same thing. You can have multiple devices and the heartbeats between them, load balancing, keeping each other healthy, all of it for security. You can do it. Here's the problem. In the cloud, you can't bring a good device with you. So what happens in the cloud, you're running virtual devices, meaning you're actually doing this cloud security on a virtual device inside of your, the marketplace, which means that if the device goes bad, it's broken. So what you typically do when you're doing these kinds of devices from the marketplace, which are awesome, by the way, is you typically have two firewalls and you use a network load balancer or a gateway load balancer to kind of follow, to kind of do some of these architectures to make sure you've got high availability. So, all right, let's let's walk it through because people are actually asking this question. Um, actually, I don't think we went through a real security design here yet. So let's walk through exactly what it would look like. Um, let's do make a new slide over here, and then I'll share my screen and we can do it together. So here's what it really looks like. It the let's say you've got a content delivery network. Let's say this is your CDN. You're going to put something like Shield Advanced here. This is going to keep people, this is going to help stop some of the DDoS attacks. Now behind your, uh, your DDoS, you're going to put a firewall. And the firewall is going to keep people from getting inside of your systems. Now, if you're using a next generation firewall, great. If you were not using a next generation firewall, you're going to put an intrusion detection, intrusion prevention system. Behind your intrusion detention, intrusion prevention systems, typically speaking, you're going to have network ACLs protecting your subnets. Then typically behind that, you're going to have a security group that's going to protect your subnets. And then behind that, now you're going to, you're going to be on your servers themselves. And on a server like this, what you're going to do is you're going to put a host-based firewall and you're going to put some anti-malware protection. And then on this, what you're going to do is you're going to disable any unnecessary service. That's how you're going to lock this down. And of course, you know, the reason we said, so this is what's protecting you. This is keeping bad guys out. This is keeping bad guys out. This is if a bad guy got in, keep them out. This is keeping more guys out of bad guys out of your subnet. This is keeping more bad guys out of your server. The host based firewall, again, protects your servers. The anti-malware protects you against things and you disabled unnecessary services so you're not listening on all ports. You know, now you've got the, what happens if, so this keep, so this keep bad stuff from getting to you in the first place. This protects the front door of your house. This protects the front door of your house. This keeps traffic from getting to your servers. This keeps traffic from getting to your servers. And then this protects your servers. Now, once your system's on, once somebody's knocked in, broken through the front door, and now they're at your house, now you've got to determine who's allowed, what they can do, and then track it. So here's where IAM comes in. After all of these things have failed, that's why IAM is the last line of defense. And then what you typically do is you also want to take any storage that you have, and you want to make sure that people can't use it should the hard drive be stolen of the cloud provider. And you do that with encryption. This, realistically speaking, this is what goes into a security architecture. So for the folks that have asked the question, where do the pieces and parts go? Yes, you block them one at a time from the edge on your way in. So I know we kind of kept it. We're, I know we're kind of doing some certification training, but, you know, I still want you guys to be cloud hired. So if you liked us doing some architecture work, 
please put hashtag cloud hired in the chat window so I know you're paying attention and hit the bell and subscribe and like and share with others if you feel appropriate, like the content's good. So while I'm waiting for you guys to let me know if you liked it with the cloud hires, I will start working into, uh... so for Jillian, MFA comes into the IAM component. It's the last, last, last component when somebody's already knocked into your door. Dean Haycox, I think you becoming a cloud security architect is awesome, especially coming from an emergency services background like you and me, those of us that really work really hard to lock systems down uh, or protect others often do well in the security environments. This security thing is really important and it takes a layered upon layered upon layered approaches. Otherwise, you know, it's not there. That's why you're dealing with really high paid good quality security people. It there's only a few, there's a such a small percentage in the world that really know how to lock these systems down. And even if you do the best of everything, at some point your systems are going to be attacked. So the point is that's why you've got to use so many layers. That's why you've got to do things. This is why you can't forget the lost art of network security by limiting routes to people that don't need it. Only the people that know how to do that, for the most part, are the CCIA level people that really know the network security. That's why on your team, you need everybody. You need networking people. You need security people. You need application people. You need engineers. Anytime you ask one person to try and do too many jobs, they're bad at everything. So be great at what you do and keep organizations from getting these problems. Now, let's talk about these AWS services. And there are a lot of them. I mean a lot of them. And a lot of questions on the exam are going to come here. So for the AWS Certified Solution Architect 2022 exam, you will see a lot of them. So let's go over these services. The first service we're going to talk about, and we've talked about it before a little bit, is Amazon SQS or Simple Queuing System. AWS SQS test answer is used to decouple your application answers. If you're asked a question on how do you decouple your application environment, the answer is SQS, simple queuing service. But realistically speaking, let's talk about what is SQS or simple queuing service. SQS is Amazon's branded simple queuing service. Here's the good news. It's pre-made for you. So you don't have to hire somebody to code it for you. So when we start thinking about the cloud and why is the cloud so great, it's because a lot of this stuff is pre-built for you. And in common, easy to use use cases, if it's pre-made, you don't have to spend a fortune to make it. And Amazon's SQS is really great. It is a message queuing service designed for transient storage. Now here's the thing, why do organizations use it? To not lose messages. So think of it this way. You've got a web server, an app server, and your database servers. If, you're, if you get orders that come in too fast through your web and app servers on the way to the database servers, they'll be dropped and lost. So imagine a retail store that gets a million orders in a second and loses a half a million of them. Look at how much money that business would lose. Half of their sales. So now if the application was decoupled, your web tier goes to your app tier and you drop the messages into an SQS queue. And then it leaves the queue into the database as needed. Problem solved. So SKS is a queue for transient message storage. It decouples your applications and it makes them scale. By default, messages placed into the simple queuing service will be kept there for four days, but you can configure it for up to two weeks. That provides a lot of message storage. And if the database were to fail, the messages could be stuck in the queue for longer. So the queue now provides you a extra way to protect your environment. SQS enables you to right-size your applications. Without this, you'd have to overbuild your databases. With this, you can drain the queue as needed. What else? SQS can help facilitate auto-scaling. You can set up a policy that says when the queue gets full, add more servers. Excellent. Without SQS, you'd have to use some specialty middleware or make it yourself for these multi-tiered applications. So love SQS. It is one of these really particular environments. Here's what it looks like. Let's say a customer to place an order over here. 
they leave, they go hit the web server, they then hit the app server, and they use SES or simple email service. We'll talk about it to send the customer, hey, thank you for your order. And then the message hits the SQS queue and hits your database and no messages are lost. That's why we use queues. So let's talk a lot more about SQS because you will use it in a lot of places. SQS is really fast. And by default, the messages come in and leave that queue as fast as possible. So fast, almost like an unlimited number of requests and messages per second. Standard queues, messages come in and leave as fast as possible. This is the fastest. You make sure that every message is delivered once, but messages in their message order is not accomplished this way. Standard queue, come in and out as fast as possible. Perfect for most environments. But what if you're dealing with an environment that requires the packets to be delivered in order? Message one, message two, message three, message four, message five. I mean, and you need the message one to come in, message one to leave, message two to come in, message two to leave in order. Then you can use a first in, forced out queue or a FIFO queue. And this is going to be high throughput, but it's going to be slower than the standard queue. Why is it going to be slower? Because if message two takes a long time to get out, then message three, four, and five can be behind it. So these are going to be slower. So just keep that in mind. The last kind of queue you can create is something called a dead letter queue, which is comes from the old mailbox world. What would happen is if the post office had letters that couldn't be delivered, they were stuck into a dead letter queue. And we can still do the same thing. Messages that don't get delivered, we stick them in a dead letter queue. We periodically check the queue and see what happened. We don't lose orders that way. We don't lose messages that way. And even better, um, we can find things that went wrong. So just to keep you informed, those are the kind of things that we're trying to do. Let's talk about how it works. Basically speaking, you've got a message that's sent from the computing platform to the queue. The message is in the queue and it gets scheduled for delivery to the ultimate destination. If the ultimate destination is busy, the message just stays in the queue until it's open. And the message can stay in that queue for upwards of two weeks based upon the configuration. The message is pulled from the queue and processed. And after it's pulled from the queue, the message is deleted from the queue. So let's now walk into, let's walk through that to give you an example. Message is sent from the sender, enters the queue. Queue's here. As soon as there's room, the message is pulled and given to the receiver and it's drained from the queue so it's not there for future things. That is, you know, when you're using what the flow is like with regards to SQS. So lastly, when do you use SQS or simple queuing service? You use SQS to assist with capacity planning. You use SQS to make sure that messages are not lost. You use SQS because it optimizes costs because it lets you use smaller computing systems in order because you have the ability to not lose the messages. So you can use a smaller system and then give it the messages as needed. SQS is a fantastic way that can help your systems auto scale. So there's two ways to auto scale. You can auto scale based upon a metric like CPU. Or you can really look at what's going on and say, I've got to scale this because there's too many messages, speed it up. So this is a great way to facilitate auto scaling. It helps you handle pike, spikes in traffic without changing your platform. SQS is really, really, really great with regards to Im um, improving the write capacity on your databases by smoothing out the writes. So. Now you know all about SQS or simple queuing system. Remember, simple queuing system is a message queuing system. I'm going to say that again. Simple queuing system is a message queuing system that is designed out to smooth the load and decouple your application environments and make your system scale. Why did I refresh that? Because now we're going to talk about SNS. What is AWS SNS or simple notification service? That is a different kind of messaging service that is a notification service. Amazon SNS is a managed messaging service to deliver messages between systems or between systems and people. It is used to decouple messages between microservice applications. SNS can be used to send an SES email, push messages to mobile devices. It's really great. 
An SNS or simple notification service facilitates communication between senders and recipients and it uses this publisher subscriber philosophy, kind of like an email distribution list. The publisher subscribe messaging model works as follows. It enables messifications, but basically as follows. Let's say I'm the uh, subscription service and I'm the publisher. I publish to a topic and the subscribers all see it, like an email list or like if you hit the bell, on a notification, you get notified of new videos that were released. So please subscribe and hit the bell for that reason. But that's a pub sub service, just like AWS SNS. So please subscribe, let the like, hit the bell, and you'll be for, informed by notification through a notification service, just like AWS SNS. So we'll talk about the publishers and subscribers. The publishers send messages to the topic and the subscribers basically subscribe to the topic. So let's look at architecturally what we're talking about here, especially because this is often used to do what's called message fan out. So let's say you've got a publisher. Let's say I'm publishing a new YouTube video. I hit the SNS topic. I may have it hit a queue. I may also have it kick off a Lambda function. I may also have it set off an email notification or even an HTTP notification like Chrome would push to you. That's what this Amazon SNS service is for. It's to push messages, to fan out messages for message distribution. So let's talk a little bit more about SNS. So SNS, which is good news, is run by default across multiple availability systems. So when you use AWS Simple Notification Service, remember, it's high availability, so you don't have to think about having a bunch of them. Uh, so you people often use it, as I mentioned, to fan out messages to a large number of subscriber systems like customer endpoints. Think like SQS queues or Lambda functions. You can use SNS to send a message to a Lambda function and an SQS queue all at the same time. So really what's going with SNS is that it allows the creation of a policy to determine who gets the notifications and where. And the good news is all your messages are encrypted to protect you from unauthorized access so nobody can see them. So let's talk about some common SNS use cases. Maybe if you want to set up an application or system alert. For example, when CPU hits 80%, notify systems administrators. Or an order comes in, and we want to use a simple notification for message fan out. It could be sent to an SQS queue to be stored. It could be then sent to a LAMP to kick off a Lambda function, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. The last major use case, and there's lots of use cases, are mobile notifications. Let's say you've got realtors, and you want to push a message to all realtors that new house is available for sale, or anything, new sale. This is the kind of push notification that we're talking about. So, so far, we've talked about the simple queuing service and the simple messaging service. So, hopefully that makes sense to you guys. Now, the next one we'll talk about, and then after we go through three or four, we'll take a stop for you guys to ask questions, is AWS, SWF, or Simple Workflow Solution. So, SWS, or Simple Workflow Solution, is a workflow management solution. It basically enables an organization to control task one, task two, task three, task four. So, if you've got an environment where you've got multiple steps, you can automate these steps so you don't have to use humans each time to do it. If you can automate, you can speed. If you can automate, you can remove mistakes. If you can automate, you reduce costs because you reduce people. So those people can then be redeployed doing things that are much higher business value, much more strategic for the organization. So let's go back here for this. Let's talk about it. So let's say you've got a multi-step workflow. Step one, step two, step three, step four. That's what SWS is for. So now let's look at it, um, SWS real quickly. And here, let's look at something that might be going on that would be pretty common. So let's say you've got a workflow that includes the following, a video processing workflow. So in this particular example, I upload a video, a raw video, simple workflow, then sends it to a next series of servers that do video optimization. For example, Maybe they take my raw video and condense it with an H.265 codec to give me high quality video at a smaller file size. Then next, let's say I want my video transcribed. So a simple workflow sends it to, to I'm a, AWS transcri the transcription service and it transcribes it. And then poof, maybe I send it to another server to burn captions into my video. 
Then maybe I take the finalized video, send it to an S3 bucket, and use SWF to then kick off the messaging service to send me an email that says, Mike, download your new video. This is what we're talking about when we're talking about these kind of services. So real quick, before we move on to the next topic, does anybody have any questions on either simple notification service, simple workflow service, or simple queuing service? If so, let me know. Otherwise, we'll get on to the next topic. Chris, were there any questions on this section that you saw? Not while you were uh, not while you were speaking. Okay, so if you have any questions, ask them now. If you're ready to go, type hashtag cloud hired, and we will keep moving on. I'm always happy to keep moving on. Okay, Jeremy, it sounds like you got it. Manish, you said cloud hired. Okay, so um, beautifully explained. I will take that and work with that and say that we're very happy with that. Okay, so if that's where you guys are all at, just waiting a couple, one or two more seconds just to be sure. And then There's we will a request move for a uh, SWF example. Okay, let's walk through an SWF example one more time. Let me do this. Let's say I work in the video business and I basically have a multi-step process. In the video process, let's say I take raw video. Let's say my workflow is upload raw video, have the raw video optimized into a video codec, like an MP4 kind of file that's much more there. After that, um, it's gonna go to get transcribed. After that, somebody's gonna add subtitles, burn into the videos. After that, the processing will be will be completed and the video is stored, and then it's going to kick off a messaging system. So yes, it is a workflow solution, a, a, a simple workflow environment. And yes, there is another example called step functions, which are very similar, and you're basically using them to scale Lambda functions. So simple workflow solutions is one way to do that, and the other way is to do that. People would talk about skinning the cat. I don't need two ways to skin this cat. I would say that's a great example, but I love cats, so I won't use that example. But hope you guys understand that. And someone asked for the significance of push versus pull. I don't know what they mean by that because um, okay. um, it's kind of out of context. Um, so I, I don't really know um, how to answer that question. It, it's missing the remaining information. So if you'd like to ask the question another way, um, I'd happily answer it. Okay, so the next question is best rule. To uh, Does a person really need to know all of the services? The person needs to know everything about the data center and the network. Everything. Because you can't take from the data center to the network what you don't know. Do you need to know all of these services? The answer is you need to know most of them. Now, having said all of that, it's uh, it's not just knowing these services. It's knowing how these services work. If you take your information from a, from the data center and you then move it to the actual cloud, you have to know what it is. So for example, if I need a virtual machine in the data center, I need a virtual machine in the cloud. If I'm using a current middleware killing system in the data center, I can use that same middleware killing system on the cloud if I choose to. Or I can swap it out with an SQS. It doesn't matter. This is just an option. So what I would say is you have to learn all of the network and the data center to be a solution architect. You must have excellent executive presence, communication skills, emotional intelligence, sales skills, presentation skills, writing, and documentation skills. That are, those are the skills for the job. Those, 60% business, 40% tech for these kind of things. So... Realistically speaking, you have to know what the services are on the cloud. For example, you might need to know for an automated thing, I can use something like a Lambda function and Google has their equivalent of Lambda function AWS. You have to know what the functions are. You need to know what kind of queuing or messaging services exist on both cloud on the cloud providers. And then you just pick one. It doesn't matter which cloud you're on. It's like going to the store. If you go to the store and buy a brick, you can buy the brick from Home Depot or AWS, but you need to know you need a brick. So you must know you need a brick. So it's more important to know what you need functionally because you can always look up the services on any cloud provider. But if you don't know you need a virtual machine, you're in trouble. 
If you don't know you need a container, you're in trouble. If you don't know where you need your firewalls, your IDS, IPS system, your, your network access control list, your security group, what services you're disabling and how to lock down your host, you're in trouble. Do you need to know the intricacies of every one of these services? No. You need to know how to design these services, and then you can look up these things every single design. But to pass the exam, you must know these things. And realistically speaking, to pass an interview, you probably should know these things as well. So part of getting cloud hired is to be solid, solid, solid. So yes, you need to know these things. Daniel Pike, Mike, can I can SQS, SNS, and SWF work together? Absolutely, and all the time. All the time. SNS can fan out your messages to an SQS queue and an email all the time. And if you've got workflow, yes, absolutely use SWF all together. Um, this is not an either or. This is a put all your pieces and parts together as part of an architecture. So the next question I see here, which I thought I saw here, which is, uh, do you need more instances to configure SQS compared? The whole point um, of using uh, Addy uh, SQS is to reduce the size and number of instances you need. Because if you didn't have the SQS queue and message would be lost, you'd have to use much, much, much bigger instances. So the reason to do this is to reduce what you need. And for the most part, you can integrate simple workflow into a lot of workflows that you're using. So Derek Houston is SQS can used in conduction queue with worker for next steps. Generally speaking, no, but uh, it's typically a step, step. So it's, it's, it's almost like the simple workflow solution where you do lambda function, lambda function, lambda function, much, much simpler than that, Derek. Larry, can you use any AWS services in creating SWF? It's not necessarily just an AWS service that you're using. It could be something else that you need to do. But yeah, the, the, you've got good flexibility in the services that you could be using. Send it to transcribe, for example. So, so sure. Um, there, there's no more questions. Okay. Excellent. So let's get back to the content then. So. Let me know that you're here having a good time by hitting that like button. If you're not a subscriber, subscribe and hit the bell. And let me know you're still here. We're ready to go by typing hashtag cloud hired. So now let's go into another service. And we're going to be getting into a lot of AWS services here. The next service we're going to talk to is AWS Elastic Map Reduce. So we talked earlier about data lakes. I forget whether it was day one or day two, but we talked about databases and creating big data environments. We talked about extraction, translation, and loading tools that could take something from your relational database, your data warehouse, your NoSQL database, your object storage, and create a data lake. Now, when you're going to mistake your data out of your big data environments and try and create a data lake, you have to massage your data to get into a format that's usable, massage it, catalyze it, analyze it. And there's lots of ways organizations do this. They can use Apache Spark on a server and not a Python script, which is typically what people do. But if you're on the cloud, you actually have the opportunity to, instead of building the script yourself, instead of really doing the heavy work, the heavy lifting with Apache Spark, you can use a pre-made tool called AWS Elastic Map Reduce. And this is basically a managed cluster for your big data frameworks. And it's really just a pre-built system to help you um, you know, massage and analyze your data. Um, it's, it's serverless. You don't have to think about it. It offers relatively high performance. And if you don't have your own tools that are built ahead of time, it might be cheaper to actually use the pre-made Elastic Map Reduce from AWS than developing your own systems. So why do people like the cloud? A lot of these tools are pre-built. Here's a perfect example. You can use Elastic Map Reduce, which does the mapping and reducing functions for creation of data lakes in a pre-made tool, which is kind of nice. So with regards to this, when we talk about Elastic Map Reduce, what's really going on, we're basically taking our object storage data or other forms of data, we're, we're pointing it to our sources of data and Elastic Map Reduce is gonna follow, it's gonna basically take your data and output it in a nice, smooth, catalog, easy way to actually understand what's going on. 
Now, the next thing I want us to talk about is, and it's not so heavily on the AWS Certified Solution Architect Associate exam, but you'll definitely find it in the AWS Certified Solution Architect Professional exam. And let's just say, if you're gonna go on an interview and you don't know this, this could potentially be not good for you. So we're gonna cover it anyway under the auspices of hashtag cloud hired. We're gonna talk about Amazon Kinesis because I feel like it's really important. And I don't wanna give you something that just helps you pass a certification that doesn't give you a complete picture of what's actually going on. So let's talk about what organizations can do with actual streaming data, because streaming data is really critical. So let's talk about some of the streaming data. There is a service called Amazon Kinesis, and this is a really cool service. Amazon Kinesis can take the place of Kafka, uh, if, if you're not used to using Apache Kafka or things like that, where you're basically connecting real-time information in real time and doing something about it. Very cool. Think about it this way. If you're a business and you could take last year's information and use it to make a better decision, that's cool. Now think about it. If you could take the information that's going on this second, take this information, internalize this information, look at the information, analyze it, and then instantly make a better business decision, that would be transformational. Business can get, get information in real time, use business analysis tools to make better decisions. Imagine being able to make better decisions because more data is available to you at all times. Woohoo! This is where life changes. This is where all these systems that we've been building and all the data that we've been connecting realistically can give you some really great environments. So let's talk about that. So Amazon has a service called Kinesis and it's designed to collect, process and analyze streaming data in real time. Real time, this is really good stuff. Um, so if you got streaming information, great. So what kind of streaming information can Kinesis deal with? Video, awesome, audio, application logs, Internet of Things devices, clicks on your website to track it, to figure out where people are going and not going and how long, all of this you can track with Kinesis. This is really great. So this is not like collect, store, and analyze after the fact. This is analyze in real time. Unbelievable, transformational for business. This is one of those things. I mean, you could do a, a Kafka cost, you could do Apache Kafka in your data center also, but this is one of these things that's complicated to do that organizations absolutely love. And Kinesis is a really great pre-made way to do this. So we're absolutely loving this. So let's talk about the kinds of Kinesis and why to use it. Imagine having large amounts of information coming in, streaming data, say weather sensors from all over the world coming in every five minutes, or airplanes saying, I'm located here. I'm at this altitude, this trajectory. I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. All this stuff. Analyze it real time. Unbelievable. So for Kinesis platforms, Kinesis video streams, Kinesis data streams, Kinesis data fire hose, and Kinesis data analytics. This stuff is really important. So let's look at video streams. Kinesis video streams enables an organization to collect multiple sources of video, ingest them, store them, and index them. So this is pretty cool. So Kinesis video streams, let's look at it this way. You can basically have video coming in from multiple sources, stream them all into Kinesis video streams, output it, collect it into something for media processing. Very cool stuff, highly transformational in businesses. Now, here's where it gets start to get really cool, Kinesis data streams. Kinesis data streams can capture your information from lots of sources, and can send it to your analytics applications within 70 milliseconds. So less than one-tenth of a second, the data that's coming in is already into your data analytics applications. This is cool. Kinesis Data Stream can capture gigabytes of data per second from hundreds and thousands of sources. So financial transactions, location tracking from a fleet of GPS devices for trucks, airplanes, you name it. So Kinesis Data Stream can ingest all this information and export it to a tool for business intelligence. I mean, this is just wild. Um, this is just incredible. So look at it this way. You take your data, you put it into Amazon Kinesis Streams, 
send it to Kinesis, and then send it to a BI tool like Tabula. You can literally look at things instantly. Or AWS QuickSight, instantly. Rapid data, you're gonna do something about it, and you're gonna make a data decision based upon information in near real time. This is extraordinary. The, uh, you know, as an enterprise architect, as a cloud architect, our job is about transforming businesses through technology. This is transformational, hugely beneficial. So time to get excited over this. Streaming data is really special. Now let's talk about some concepts when we're dealing with these things. You've got a data producer, things that send data. So internet of things bleeping from everywhere, data producer. What happens is the data producers send records and they actually have a partition key along the way, which determines how these things are drawn. Now, when you're dealing with data streams, you're dealing with something called shards. And basically a shard is just a unit of throughput. So what happens, you'll have to purchase the number of shards that you need or the amount of throughput for your clickstream data or whatever your data coming is. Data producers are things that send the data. Data consumers are the things that receive the data. So it's like watching TV. The producer produces the TV show that you watch, and the consumer, which is basically your applications, are going to retrieve the data and go do something about it. So producers produce um, and send. Consumers consume the data. Now, while we're actually at it, let's talk about the data stream, which is, in AWS terms, a logical grouping of shards. And a data stream will retain its data for 24 hours, but up to 365 days, which is a year. And just as I mentioned before, a shard is a unit of throughput. So now let's look about use cases for data. So basically large event data connections, real-time data analytics, capturing game and data, capturing mobile data. Imagine this. Let's say there were 50,000 of you today on this call. And instead of me and Chris and maybe Jesse from my team trying to aggregate questions and things coming in, we could literally pull, send all this information in. And when we send all of this information in, we can analyze it in real time. So instead of two people, we know how to pop the screens with all the things coming in. Streaming information is unbelievable. So that's Kinesis. Now, let's talk about the other Kinesis services. We'll talk about Kinesis Data Firehose. Now, this is really used to collect information. So when you're dealing with Kinesis Firehose, basically what happens is your streaming data is taken in, and this can push or output your streaming data and put it in S3, which is object storage, which you know, which has metadata. It can put it in your data warehouse like Redshift or many, many other services. Amazon Kinesis is very, data firehose is very useful. Now Kinesis data firehose is again, auto scaling, monitoring. So it's one of those services that's gonna meet your need. Let's talk a little bit about a Kinesis firehose. Um, as with any of these things, your pricing is based on throughput, which is based upon the number of shards. When you need additional capacity, you get it. Now, pretty important to note, while I said this is unlimited, typically speaking, you get up to 10 shards per region per account by default. But if you need more, you can get them, but you have to request a limit increase from AWS. And you can basically set up an auto scaling policy to make sure you have the number of shards or throughput based upon what you need. So let's look at this very quickly to show you what this environment would look like. With Kinesis Data Firehose, you're gonna collect your data and you'll put it in Firehose. Then you'll put it into say an S3 bucket or basically AWS Redshift, like a data warehouse. And then you'll use your, your business tools like QuickSight or Tabula to go analyze it. So again, another way to collect and store real-time storing, da storing data. And I tend to love these kind of things. Let's talk about a couple more Kinesis concepts and then we'll move on. Again, this is necessary for more of that cloud hired and this is necessary for your interview piece. You will not see the Kinesis things in much depth on the Certified Solution Architect Associate exam, but you will find it on the AWS Certified Solution Architect Professional exam and you also will need to know it for interviews. So we're talking about it here. So what's going on here? We will talk about the next... Uh, so when you're dealing with Kinesis Firehose concept, remember, basically the whole point is to take your streaming data and collect it and store it. So now that we're done talking about that, let's just talk about Kinesis Analytics. Kinesis Data Analytics is a service that's designed to transform your analyzing data 
streaming data into something you can do something with it. So Kinesis Data Analytics uses a Apache Flick to basically process data streams. Kinesis Data Analytics, the streams are auto, the streams are auto scaling, and the data on your Kinesis streams when you're using data analytics can be queried to a standard SQL query. So now it's basically another Kinesis, but in this case, it's going straight into your analytics tools. So how are these analytics tools going to work? Basically, your data is captured by streams, Firehose, or, or one of these services like Elasticsearch. And then Kinesis Data Analytics will analyze your data in real time. It'll come in from here. And then it will send it to analytics tools. So all we're really doing with any of these services is following, taking in the data and sending it to tools so we can do something with the data. Data without doing anything with it is a waste of time, a waste of money, collecting things that cost us. Being able to analyze that data can do incredible things for us. So you know now you know why we're focusing on these kind of things. Now, previously, I told you that when it comes to computing, there's only two platforms. And it's true. You're either going to be having servers, which are virtual machines, they're called EC2 instances in AWS, virtual machines in Azure, or compute engine on Google, or you're going to be using a container. That's it. All you're computing on the cloud is a container or a virtual machine. Now, when you set up containers, you typically need something to orchestrate it or manage the containers, and then you need to build the containers. Now, lots of organizations basically set up their own Kubernetes clusters that is the container organization. They can set on an EC2 instance, virtual machine, or a server, and then they have servers that actually do the containers. Lots of organizations do that, and perfectly acceptable way to do it. Most of the organizations I worked have done it this way, but if you wanted to get something that makes it easier, AWS has two options. They're going to have the Elastic Container Service and the Elastic Kubernetes Service. So they're both for container orchestration. So let's talk about the Elastic Container Service first. Basically what happens is AWS has a serverless pre-made container orchestration service. So we remember when we talked before on the previous day, we talked about the difference between a virtual machine and a container. We talked about how a virtual machine has a physical server and it has a hypervisor and that each virtual machine has its own operating system and applications. And we talked about containers basically being a server with a guest OS, with a container runtime module, with multiple logically isolated containers that basically each have the application and some operating system dependencies. We talked about how they were lightweight before. And we talked about we need a manager or an orchestrator, and then we need the, the stuff for the servers to run. So AWS, as I mentioned, has that Elastic Container Service for orchestration or the Elastic Kubernetes Service for orchestration. Well, that's here, and these are your servers that are actually running your containers. So let's look at it this way. AWS Elastic Container Service is a management service for your containers. And that's really all it is. It manages and orchestrates your container. So let's look at it this way. This is what we're typically talking about with the AWS Container Service. You're going to have the container service that's going to orchestrate your containers. And then you got to put your container somewhere. Your containers typically are going to go on a server with an operating system, and your containers are going to be there but you need the orchestration of these containers. And that is what's provided by the AWS Elastic Container Service. So the Elastic Container Service is a fully managed container service that's four nines availability. So the AWS calls that high availability, meaning 99.99% of the time, which means basically 50 minutes of downtime per year, plus or minus a few minutes, and it's a high security service. So what happens is if you deploy, you deploy ECS or Elastic Container Service inside of your virtual private cloud, your VPC, and that way, you can lock these systems down with network ACLs and security groups. Basically, what happens is ECS is going to manage your containers. Now, where you put your containers can be one of two places. You can put your containers in a virtual machine. This is what we've done forever. And it works great. Put it on a server, virtual machine, perfect. Or there's the serverless option. We're going to show you both. The primary way we've always done these things is going to be as follows. We typically use a container orchestration service, which we typically run on our own servers. If we use the AWS Elastic Container Service, all that we're really doing in this particular environment is we're using the AWS service to go manage the orchestration. 
Then what happens is we build our containers and then we, we put them on a, a computer or like a server, an EC2 instance, and then we provision them at the, the compu computing platform. We create our containers. We make sure they're all separated and isolated on the same serv server. And then we manage our applications and we just pay for an EC2 instance. And we can put a lot of containers on an EC2 instance and it works perfectly. But we can also do this serverless. So in this traditional environment, we use ECS for container orchestration, and then we just place our virtual machines on multiple, on a single or multiple EC2 instances. Now that works great. Love that environment. Simple. Take it from one environment, move it to the next environment because you're managing your containers on some virtual machines. Now, you could also go serverless. Here's the way serverless is going to work. You're going to use a system called AWS Fargate. And what will happen is Fargate will host your computing platforms in a container. They'll scale up, they'll scale down. For the most part, everything you need. Now there are some limitations on those containers. They say almost unlimited scalability, but there are some memory and CPU limitations on these containers, which are relatively strong. But you know, you can use more containers. You can route between microservices with load balancers. So I showed you previously the way the traditional way: build your containers. Run your container orchestration, put your containers on a server. That's what I like and you usually do, but this is also kind of a cool service. And if you wanted, what you could truly do is as follows. You can use the Elastic Container Service and instead of setting up your EC2 instances, you could then choose to use a serverless container runtime module. So you basically would build your containers, you would tell them how much compute memory resources you need, and stick them on Fargate, and everything is managed for you, and then you pay for what you use. So you're not using your containers a lot. This service is going to be really great, cost-effective, and efficient. With any of these things that you go pay as you go, it's often cheaper, if you've got something that's you heavily used, to use a server, because you pay for the server, and it might be cheaper. But if you're running a bunch of small ones, or if you're looking for simplicity and elegance, and you don't want the hassle of managing servers and operating systems and container runtimes, and you're looking for simplicity and, and scalability, the, the Fargate option or the serverless option is also really great. So you can host them on computers like we talked about, or servers on EC2 instances, virtual machines, if say you're on Azure, Compute Engine, and Google, or you can use the pre-managed service, and the AWS pre-managed service is less to compute service, does the orchestration, and Fargate is the best place for you to put your serverless compute environments. So now you know. Let's talk a little bit more about these services. <coughs> you can run it on an EC2 instance or Fargate. Um, I like you to think about it this way. If you need real control, put your containers on an EC2 instance. If you're looking for simplicity, use Fargate. And the you'll have to determine the cost, which is most cost effective. Now, since we talked about Elastic Container Service as an orchestration, and then either Fargate or EC2 instances to host your containers, that's using the Amazon branded Elastic Container Service. But what if you want something a little more industry standard? You could, of course, host your own Kubernetes cluster for container management and then build all your containers with Kubernetes, or AWS has a fully managed Kubernetes service to manage your clusters, and that's called EKS. Stick Elastic in front of it, and you'll know what it is. So Amazon Elastic Kubernetes Service. So basically, this is just a container orchestration environment provided by AWS. Of course, it's serverless because it's provided from them. It uses Kubernetes, which is basically the de facto standard for containers, and it's an open source container management platform. And basically speaking, we just talked about ECS or the Elastic Container Service. That's the Amazon branded, Amazon proprietary way to manage your container. The Elastic Con Kubernetes Service is basically a Kubernetes cluster that's pre-managed for you in a serverless environment. So you can set up your Elastic Kubernetes Service instead of your Elastic Container Service. They're functionally equivalent, but this is more industry standard, so I would recommend this. And then after Elastic Kubernetes Service, you can stick it on an EC2 instance or Firegate that serverless environment just like before. So let's kind of look at this real quick. Let's look on this Elastic Kubernetes service. You see we're using Kubernetes, the Elastic Kubernetes service for container orchestration. 
we can put our containers on EC2 instances, or we can put them on Fargate for serverless. That's it. That's how simple and elegant the situation actually is. Let's talk about the next AWS service, which you could see on exam, and that is called AWS Elastic Beanstalk. AWS Elastic Beanstalk is a service for provisioning, deploying, and scaling web applications and services. Basically speaking, and again, this is automatic, and we'll talk about automatic, with Elastic Beanstalk, you upload your code, and Amazon is going to deploy in the best way possible your infrastructure, your EC2 instances, your containers, your load balances, infrastructure automatically deployed this way is auto scaling. And if you need additional infrastructure, it's going to be coming load balanced. No. Now, remember this. This is automatic. And if you trust a computer to design and build you the perfect infrastructure, then this is an option. If you're like me, and you've been working in tech for a couple of decades, you know that anytime you do something automatic, it's never great. Automatic is never as good as architecturally designed and planned for by great architects. So you could do this, or you could design it on your own with an architecture team and build a much, much better product. But I do like this. It's simple. Upload your code and it deploys it. And if you're not an architect and if you're an engineer trying to do these things and you're a good scripter, but you don't know end-to-end -end system design, for many people, this could be a good option. But it's never going to be as good as having a great architect designing the way it needs to be. So keep that in mind with Elastic Beanstalk. Here's what it looks like with Elastic Beanstalk as follows. Basically, you put the user's code into Elastic Beanstalk and it will auto deploy your web servers, app servers, caching, databases, anything that's necessary based upon the code. Okay, you know what? I'm gonna take a quick break and ask if anybody has questions. There was a question. Give me just a second to bring it up. All right, here we go. Oh, no. Yeah, here we go. Okay, so the question is, I'm trying to see it. Can you please give some real, exa real example use cases for an EMR? And actually, I will do so very quickly because this is way, way, way out of the scope of the Certified Solution Architects Associate. Anytime you're dealing with an organization that has a big data environment, they're always going to have a relational database for finding the relationships between variables. They're always going to have a, a NoSQL database for an unstructured and big data. They're also typically going to have a... Uh, uh, what's, what, are you, what are you referring to? They're also typically going to have a data warehouse. Now, in addition to these things, they're typically going to have object storage. So EMR is used to take the data in and out of these informations and, and catalog it and create a data lake. So that's typically where you're using these kind of things. This is a big data environment. Realistically speaking, when we're talking about you know setting up these environments and designing these environments with mapping and reduction, we're typically talking about a cloud big data architect and not a cloud architect. They're the people that do these things. There are people that will spend the next 30 years focusing on these big data environments and, and, and it takes a lot of knowledge because basically these are people that are going to be looking at a data ingestion, data sending, data, data manipulation, mapping and reduction functions, extraction, translating, or loading tools. This is a specialty that people can literally spend 20 years on. Actually, because of that, next Friday, as it turns out, I have my, my good friend Praveen, who is a very good cloud architect, who spent 20 years in a big data environment. And on next Friday, I, at 9 a.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. UK time, we are going to walk through big, big, big data architectures just like this and how to set them up, and how to build them. And we'll go into a lot more depth. But you know what? That's going to be taught by someone with 20 years of big data. So I want to make sure we give you guys the best and the brightest. It's outside of the realm of the cloud architect, though we cloud architects know a lot about it. Definitely in the realm of the cloud big data architects. And I have a good friend who's a cloud architect and a working cloud architect and also has 20 years experience in big data. So I'm going to bring them for you guys all on Friday. So if you want that, that, uh, that is a gift. In the, in the Hit the like button, share with friends, inform others, and say cloud big data architect. And I know you want to see it. 
and I'll make sure to inform Praveen to make sure he's ready and excited to teach a large group of hundreds and or thousands of people. So let me know cloud big data in the chat box below. Chris, I see a few more questions. Yes, is there was Lex being stuck the equivalent of you know, Google's app engine. Google's app engine, if I, I'm pretty sure, is the equivalent of a Lambda function. Basically, you just install some code and it works. So I think they're a little bit different. Chris, if you'd like to bring up the next one. It, it's up. What is the difference between Kubernetes and Docker? Docker, they are two different orchestration services. Kubernetes is a great service you run on your desktop. Um, you want to run some additional containers. Typically speaking, Kubernetes as the big cluster is designed to scale. There's so many self-healing and self awesome nice capabilities with Kubernetes. Big organizations are using Kubernetes for their containers, everyone. It's the, it's the de facto standard for the most part. Docker is another container runtime module. It is fantastic. I've got Docker containers I run, but big businesses use this. Deepak, how do you migrate applications to the new EC2 if I need to upgrade the OS? Okay, what do you mean? How do I migrate applications to the new EC2 if you, let's say, using Linux for six months now? I'm not really sure I understand the question. If, if you've got something on a, on a server, you can upgrade the server the way you would upgrade any server. Like for example, a sudo app dash get update on a on a Linux uh, on a on a, on a Debian system or a yum install or a yum update on a, on a thing. So I'm not sure I completely understand the question. Now, if you're asking how to take a virtual machine in your data center and move it to the cloud, which is all what we do as cloud architects, that's why you must know the data center. It's no more than basically taking a tool to take your virtual machine in the data center and convert it to a machine that you just basically secure FTP or you put on a snowball or you put on the storage gateway and migrate those things directly to the cloud. It's very simple. So if I knew exactly what you were trying to do, I could answer it. But basically speaking, you know, the way you would do it in the data center and the way you do it in the cloud is identical. The cloud is nothing more than a virtualized network and data center. Nothing more, like literally the same in every way. Does it mean that Fargate can scale out? You can always scale out containers just like you can always scale out um, servers. Fargate is, uh, it's not the Fargate that's scaling out, it's the container orchestration service that says, wait a second, um, we need more containers, this container is unhealthy, um, so you need something to orchestrate it, and you need a runtime environment. But Fargate will let your container scale in a very simple way. They could also scale great on an EC2 instance, it's just a place to house your things. M.W. Murrow, please go through how to put containers in a virtual machine again, the one without Fargate. Sure. What you do is as follows. And there is a video on our YouTube channel on how to do these kind of environments. Chris, from my team, we had Sandeep Daz do some container migrations with me. And Chris will provide the link to that video. But I will go over this containers management service one more time to make it pretty clear to you. So this is what it would look like in a tr traditional environment. You would use the Elastic Container Service or the Elastic Kubernetes Service. That's it. Or... You would set up an EC2, three, a couple of EC2 instances, and you'd put your own Kubernetes cluster. They're all the same. Elastic Container Service, Amazon Proprietary. I don't use proprietary anything, so this is not an option for me. I use industry specific, and that way I can go from cloud to cloud. So if we were using the Elastic Kubernetes Service, which is a functional equivalent to this, but industry standard, so much better, then basically speaking, we'd run our Elastic Kubernetes cluster. And then we would basically get in, we'd, we'd set up our containers and then we'd take an EC2 instance and we'd push our containers to the EC2 instance. We would tell our, the, we would determine the size of the server we need. And that's pretty much it. We'd set up an EC2 instance, determine the number of processing cores and DRAM, make sure the operating is installed, make sure the operating system is locked down because you should on every server, disable unnecessary services. You got a greater security and it performs better. Put your containers on an EC2 instance and, and and basically just run them. So it's no different than it would be running anywhere, any place in the environment. Same thing. 
identical to the same. Chris, was there another, any more before we move on? I didn't see any more. Okay, so let's keep going. No, there wasn't. Okay. The next service is called CloudWatch. CloudWatch is a, a monitoring thing. That is it, monitoring. That's CloudWatch. So CloudWatch is a monitoring service used to monitor your resources as well as your application. Logging and knowing what's going on in your systems is absolutely essential. If you don't know what's going on in your systems, um, you find yourself in trouble. So CloudWatch is a logging or monitoring service with, from AWS. CloudWatch will provide metrics to monitor performance, help you troubleshoot things, and it can work with built-in metrics or custom metrics. So when we talk about the AWS native logging, the built-in default metrics are really little. Basically, you get CPU utilization, disk read and write, and network utilization. And that's it. You've got no memory utilization with basic default apps. So basic CloudWatch default metrics basically are very minimal. CPU utilization, disk read and write in terms of IOPS and network utilization, and that is it. So that's probably not gonna be enough for anybody. So. You can use your own system management tools, which can be installed on all systems, or you can use other forms of CloudWatch, which we'll talk about in a minute. Now, if you really need to monitor things, you can use a CloudWatch custom metric. And now you can start monitoring things that matter, such as memory utilization, API performance, and many other metrics. So realistically, CloudWatch custom metrics give you real data about what's going on in your environment. CloudWatch default metrics give you a little bit and that might be okay for a small business. It's terrific, but for a big business, you're going to need a lot more because you're going to have a complicated architecture and you're going to have to constantly be adapting this. So CloudWatch basically is a notification system that will notify customers um, like what's going on. Now, the good news is CloudWatch events, which also sometimes gets called event branch, is very similar in today's world. Basically, something goes on. Hey, CPU is too high. Trigger auto scaling. Kick off a Lambda function to automate something. Send an SSNS notification. Hey, by the way, admins, things are going on. You got to go look at it. And basically a whole lot of functions. So CloudWatch is really important. Now, when we're dealing with CloudWatch, we've got two forms of monitoring. Basic monitoring and detailed monitoring. Basic monitoring gives you information about your systems at every five minutes. And it's no charge. But think about five minutes. A lot can go on in five minute intervals. For example, I can tell you in the last 30 years in tech, a lot of times you would look at CPU metrics of routers, for example, and they'd look like they were 30%. What the five minute metrics didn't show you is that the router was at 100% for 10 seconds and then lost routes and black hole for traffic. Then it worked great at 20% for the next two minutes. Then it happens to be at 100% and you have a problem for three seconds and then it goes to 50%, you don't know. So when you start looking at monitoring over five minutes and you start aggregate, averaging or aggregating, it's like, oh, this looks great. But when you start looking more closely and pull at more frequent intervals, you can find that, wow, this is not so great. So now we're into detail monitoring and with detail monitoring, data is available every minute. But of course, you're gonna pay for that. So detail monitoring must be enabled at the EC2 instance level because you're paying for it, you wanna pay it for where you need it. Now, talking more about CloudWatch events, CloudWatch events delivers a re near real-time stream of systems of events that describe you know, what's going on. You set up the rules and you route the events to a function or a stream, and CloudWatch will let you know when things occur because it's paying attention, and it will send a message, activate a Lambda function to remediate things, capture state information. CloudWatch events will let you know what's going on. Now, if CloudWatch is for monitoring, CloudTrail is for auditing. And CloudTrail is an AWS service that will assist with the auditing process. It will provide an audit log that will assist with risk management, compliance. CloudTrail will track any changes you made. CloudTrail is enabled when you create the account. And if you want to use it, you basically create a trail. So start to create a trail with the CloudWatch console, CLI, or Cloud Trail API, and it will record events that are needed. 
So let's look into things that you're going to hear. It will give you an event history that will show you all the events that have occurred in 90 days. So something happened, you can go back through these logs and figure out who did what. Excellent. If your systems got hacked, you may be able to figure out when, where, and how through these audit logs. So basically speaking, you can create a cloud trail, which is the auditing logs. You can create a trail that applies to one region. And this is a trail that exists only in a single region. And it stores your CloudWatch logs into a single bucket. And this is the default out of the box. Now, if you want to get more information, you can cr create a cloud trail that applies to all regions. And this is going to give you really comprehensive logging, really comprehensive auditing functionality. It's going to provide a record of all events that have occurred inside of your organization's infrastructure. And this will help you correlate events across your entire environment. So let's look about, look at CloudTrail in action. Basically, you've got a server, you've got some IAM things going on, you've got a database. CloudTrail will capture every change and log it for you in an S3 bucket. So it's going to help you figure out exactly what you need on your systems. Now let's talk about another service called AWS Config. Again, this is something that can help with your security. Um, it's, a, it's a service that enables the assessment, auditing, and, mod and evaluation of your configurations. AWS Config gives you an opportunity to see who made what changes and when they were made. Basically, when a change is made, if you're using AWS Config, it will capture that change and send an SNS alert to the system's admin. So you can say, oh, somebody changed something. And you can find out if it was good, yes. If it was bad, you can do something about it. So let's talk a little bit more about AWS Config. AWS Fig provides constant monitoring of configurations, and it will check these configurations against your organization's policies. If a change is made that violates the policies, an SNS alert is sent to the uh, CloudWatch event and sent. Basically speaking, AWS Config provides a means to assist with change management. AWS Config can track the relationships between resources. So if a change is made in one location, it will be easily to determine who made it and when. So you can integrate your cloud, your AWS Config with cloud trails. So this is going to give you lots of information to see who made changes, when they were made, how they were made, and how to keep your system protected and or revert these changes. So. Let's look really carefully. A configuration change is made. AWS Config is going to note it. It's going to record it in the same way each time so you can correlate things. AWS Config will then check the change against your organization's policy. And this is really great. If the change doesn't match the policy, AWS Config will notify what things are out of compliance and what changes have occurred so you can go fix it. Man, this is really great service. Let's really look at what's going on over here. With AWS Config, a configuration change will ma is made. Config will monitor it, and it will it will tell you in lots of different ways somebody made a change. So, I hope um, we went through those AWS services. We did them relatively quickly. The reason we did them relatively quickly um, is we've got a lot of these services to cover. Now, let's talk about a really important concept. Content delivery networks. We briefly touched them on day one. We've gone back to caching and queuing in a couple times. Let's make sure we cover the AWS CloudFront very well. AWS CloudFront is the Amazon branded content delivery network. A content delivery network is both a network and a distributed group of caching servers spread throughout the world to provide fast access to an organization's content. Content delivery networks can often reduce bandwidth costs and make things cheaper. Here's the thing. Let's say you had a, a, a but you were you had a S3 bucket waste website and it was held in the US. If you've got users in the in Europe that keep pulling from that same bucket, you're going to pay a lot of inter-region transfer charges. By comparison, if it goes through the content delivery network and it's cached, it's going to save a lot, especially because not all requests will go to the server. So the content delivery network reduces your networking costs, reduces your transfer cost, increases the speed, and reduces the need for server capacity because the caching servers help reduce the load on your servers. So content delivery networks are going to help you in a lot of ways. They generally reduce cost. They generally improve performance. They generally improve website security because illegitimate requests will never be sent to the web server. They'll be blocked at the cache, at the edge locations. 
and content delivery networks can promote enhanced availability. For example, if your web server goes down for 60 seconds, but somebody already requested the same website and it's stored in the cache, you might even be able to serve that web request because it's already there. So can help with availability, helps with performance, and can reduce cost, and definitely helps with scalability. So CloudFront can really help with your website performance because let's look at it this way. Let's say you've got a million requests per second. Let's say all of those requests are for the same content. Only the first request hits the web server and the other 9 million, 900,000, 900,000, 900, 900, 999,999 other requests wouldn't even see the web server. So that's how these, uh, what do you call it? Um, caching systems and, and content delivery networks can really help. So they're fantastic. How does it work? Basically the following. I send a cache to the content. I send a request for a website. I go straight to the content delivery network. And, and actually, let me show you graphically what it looks like. Here's the way a content delivery network works. I want to go to the www.gocloudcareers.com website. The first time I make my request, I'm near Palm Beach, Florida. The CloudFront distribution is near Miami, I believe. So I leave my house. I go to www.gocloudcareers.com. I hit my edge front, I hit my content delivery network. If the content delivery network has it, it sends it right back to me. In this particular case, content delivery network does not already have stored www.gocloudcareers.com. So Amazon CloudFront, the content delivery network, will send it to where my website is stored, which is in this S3 bucket. The S3 bucket will respond with the www.gocloudcareers.index.html or .home.html webpage, which is our main site, which will then give it back to CloudFront, and then it will send it to here. Now, the next time a client in South Florida, before the cash times out, wants to go to the Go Cloud Careers website, they type www.gocloudcareers.com on their browser. It instantly gets sent to the CloudFront distribution. The CloudFront distribution has it, and it sends it back to me. So that is, realistically speaking, how content delivery networks speak content. It helps with scalability because frequent requests aren't going to go to the server and because it, it really offloads frequently requested data. Now, if all your content was new and it was never shared, a content delivery network would add latency into the system. But in general, most websites, people are accessing the same information. And for that, the content delivery networks make a huge difference. So because you're dealing with AWS, you're going to be using CloudFront with a lot of things because Everybody uses the content delivery network, whether it's Akamai's or somebody else's content delivery network to really improve performance. So you basically can use it with S3. You can use it with EC2 instances, assuming you're using a load balancer in front of them. Um, so that, typically speaking, so CloudFront is often used to front end static websites on S3, but you can also front end dynamic websites across EC2 instances if an elastic load balancer is part of the architecture. So let's look at what it could look like over here. Realistically speaking, here you've got an organization that's got static and dynamic content. The organization sets up a CloudFront content delivery network distribution over here. Static content is served out of an AWS S3 bucket. Dynamic content is served um, from the cloud term distribution, which hit the elastic load balancer where, for which we get the website on our EC2 instances. That's kind of how these things work. Now, CloudFront is pretty important. I want to go over some CloudFront concepts in case you see them in the exam. Now, realistically speaking, we've gone a little above the AWS Certified Solution Architect Associate level. Now we're getting into the AWS Certified Solution Architect Professional level, but we want you to get cloud hired and you need to know this. So if you get an interview, you have to have some knowledge here. So I want you to understand three concepts. We're going to talk about distributions, origins and cache control because they all can set up basically speaking um the distribution is basically the origin of your information so when you set up cloudfront you set up a distribution now your distribution is going to have a dns name and it's going to be an ugly dns name once you set this up uh, the cloudfront distribution i'm sorry the cloudfront distribution is going to be the new website the origin is going to be where your content is stored but the distribution you're going to set up it's going to have a new dns name and it's going to be an ugly name it's going to like a a b c d e f g one two three one two three one two three dot 
cloudfront.net. It's going to be some ugly looking DNS name. So what you're typically going to do is you're going to use this ugly name. You're going to set up a CNAME DNS record. It's going to map www.gocloudcareers to some other ugly looking CNAME, uh, ugly looking URL that comes out of the CloudFront distribution. So when the customer wants to go to www.gocloudcareers.com, they're going to hit that page in their browser. It's going to go to the CloudFront distribution unknown to the user, and then they'll get their web pages and it will be fast, great content. So you could just use the old URL, the one they're going to give you, but I promise you, no website's going to be able to remember that. So you're going to decide up a C name record. The next thing that needs to be set up is the origin. What is the CloudFront origin? It's the location where your content is coming from. So whether it's your S3 bucket, your, your EC2 instance, or the load balancer, whatever it is that's going to be the origin, it's going to be where it's there. So you might point it to the load balancer, and behind the load balancer, there's your EC2 instances. So the origin is going to point to the DNS name. The last part of this is cache control. Here's the thing. The Content Delivery Network caches or stores your information. Awesome. And that's what prevents the web servers from working so hard. Now, by default, the information is cached for 24 hours. This is pretty awesome. So for 24 hours, if it hits your, your website and that CloudFront distribution, for 24 hours, those new requests for the same content aren't going to go back to the server, which is great. But what if you change your website three times a day? For example, dynamic content. If you've got a cache involved and it stores the data for 24 hours and you update your page three times a day, users may not get the most up-to-date content because it's going to store the first one for 24 hours until the cache time's out. So what happens is you can set up your time to live. Look at it this way. The longer your time to live, the reduced workload on your servers, the better DDoS protection you have, and the faster speeds and the reduced costs. All great things. But you will also run the risk of having out-of-date data if your website changes. So you change your cache to basically be about the time that you change your data. So if you were to change your data three times a day, you would run approximately an eight-hour cache. If you set up your cache for a week, realistically speaking, for a whole one week, your web servers would see no traffic. But if you change your data, your web page midweek, it could be upwards of seven days until somebody could actually see the new content. So that's the thing going on with the cache. You set up that time to live or how long your data stays in the cache. So how do you set it up? You set up your web servers, you put your content, you create your CloudFront distribution. AWS assigns a name for your CloudFront distribution. You can accept that name, which you won't, or create a DNS CNAME record for a name that's pleasant. And AWS will provision and configure the edge locations. Remember, this is what it looks like. And we talked about it on the first day in real depth, but the edge location is gonna be as, was gonna look as follows. Basically speaking, you've got your systems, your users access the information via the edge location, and then the edge locations go back here. Should they not actually have it there? Now let's talk about one more thing, and this is way out of scope of the Certified Solution Architect Associate. And that is the AWS Cloud Front private content. Let's say you want to use CloudFront to serve. You're normally using it to promote service to your to your to your to your website. But what if you're like a Netflix? What if you've got paid website subscribers? What if you've got private applications? What if you want to restrict content to certain users? You can do this. Basically, you would set up an origin access identity, which is basically if you had your information on S3, you would restrict that bucket. Um, to a certain number of individuals. That would work perfectly. You could use signed URLs, for example, and use a pre-signed URL, or you can use a signed cookie. But these are the kind of things that you can actually do to improve your performance. Now let's talk about the next concept, concept which is Amazon Lambda. Lambda is a serverless computing environment for basic minimalistic functions. Basically, you upload your code, and it's serverless. So there's nothing to manage. You can set up a C Sharp, a Go, a Java, Node.js, or a Python automated function on a Lambda function. AWS enables you to run Lambda, Lambda functions, and then really it's to automate things. So step one, step two, step three, step four, step five, that's what a Lambda is. 
Lambda can, can, if you remember, we talked about simple workflow solution and I talked about automating it and someone said, hey, isn't that like, you know, setting up multiple Lambda functions one at a time? And the answer is yes. This is a different way to do it. Lambda functions are simple. You say you have a you know you have a system monitoring your buckets. You see an S3 bucket that's open. Lambda can remediate it for you. So Lambda can be used to send a message. Lambda can use to kick off a function. Lambda is really great. So you got to remember that when you're using these little mini Lambda functions, they are stateless, meaning nothing's tracking it, nothing's going on. And uh, meaning if you need multiple Lambda functions. You're going to have to set up, mul if you need multiple steps in your workflow, you're going to have to set up multiple Lambda functions. One Lambda function does one thing, it runs, and it's done. There's no way to basically have a Lambda function be intelligent enough to know to do something else. So Lambda is useful in situations, processing data across multiple systems, remediating again against security events, patching operating systems. Lambda is awesome for this. So you can basically, for example, kick off, like we went through a video example. I could have a user upload a video to a system and I could use a Lambda function to basically say, take that and move that file. Um, so realistically speaking, I can have a Lambda function trick up, uh, tr uh, what do you call it, a kick off, um, a simple notification service or an email, literally anything I want. Lambda functions are a really great way to automate. So what do they look like? Basically, they look like this. Let's say I were to upload a video and I kicked off the Lambda to S3. I can kick off a Lambda function that can say, hey, transcribe this and go to the transcription service. And then I could set up another Lambda function to basically send an email that we received it or take the video, optimize it, and then push it to another bucket. Lambda functions are odd for automation. Now, while we discuss Lambda, there's another version of Lambda called Lambda and Edge. Realistically speaking, that just enables you to run a Lambda function on the content delivery network at the edge location close to your customers. That's it. So since we talked about Lambda functions not being stateful, being able to do one thing, the next thing, the next thing, you'd have to set, you'd have to schedule Lambda functions. Because I remember, remember I said Lambda does not keep track. So we have a concept called step functions. So you can basically design multiple steps. Lambda function one runs. Step function kicks off lambda function two. Lambda function two completes. Step function kicks off lambda number three. So it's kind of an orchestration for lambda functions. So let's look at it this way. Let's say I designed an application. Let's say the steps of the application are as follows. I uh, design the steps. I create a lambda function per, per step. I then configure the workflow and the Amazon step functions. And I connect the workflow to different Lambda functions and, I, and they're executed in normal use. So let's walk through this one more time. If we walk through this here, we've got a simp, we've set up step functions. And when we set up step functions, here's what we did. We have a step one, Lambda function runs. Step two, Lambda function runs. Step three, Lambda function runs. Step four, Lambda function runs. Now we're going to talk about one thing, then we'll answer some questions and we'll go back. We're going to talk about AWS recognition. AWS recognition is a way to analyze videos and images using machine learning. It's really cool. Amazon recognition can identify people. It can identify whether people are happy or sad. Or they can identify facial expressions. It can find unwanted content in your videos. Very, very valid, important thing. It can easily do a search a video for a certain person. It can look for objects, logos, things that are not supposed to be there or you want to be there, and it can detect anomalies. So AWS recognition, really cool service to figure what's going on in your environment. Actually, you know what? Because of where I'm actually located in the content, I am going to keep going for a couple more slides before we do questions. The next thing we'll talk about is CloudFormation. This is something, again, for your DevOps engineers, where we architects, we never get involved in something like this, but the DevOps engineers definitely will be. Some of your cloud engineers might, and occasionally some of your sysops engineers could be involved in doing this as well. Cloud formation templates are a means to make a template of a known configuration and then deploy them in an automated environment. These are really cool. So if you know you need to provision a thousand servers a certain way, if you can create a CloudFormation template to go do it, it is efficient. 
There are also other tools in the industry that do this. CloudFormation is the AWS only template to basically automate the deployment. And we'll talk about what organizations probably do instead. So you basically set up a CloudFormation template, which you have a lot of options. You write the code for your template in either JSON or YAML format, like think YAML, think Kubernetes, think containers. You basically store your code on S3. You basically use and access the code via the CLI or the API or the console port. And CloudFormation will provision your systems based upon what's in the code. This is automated. This is excellent. This is a DevOps tool. This is AWS branded. Perfect example. More organizations are actually using Terraform for this reason. Terraform works across all cloud providers. CloudFormation works across AWS. Terraform works across all. It's very rare to find just AWS or just Azure or just GCP now. Everything is multi-cloud or hybrid cloud. So CloudFormation templates, AWS branded things to, to auto deploy things on AWS. Swap that out with Terraform and you can create your hybrid cloud and multi-cloud environments in minutes. Much better version of the same thing, but this is the AWS branded one and it's an AWS exam. So we're gonna talk about it. The last service we'll talk about here in the form of AWS services is the AWS certificate manager. Here's the thing. The AWS Certificate Manager is a way for you to get SSL or TLS certificates for your environment. Certificate Manager will add a layer of protection to websites by giving you SSL certificates. Certificate Manager enables the simple provisioning, management, and the deployment of certificates. So Certificate Manager makes it easy for you by deploying these certificates. So realistically speaking, what is Certificate Manager? It's something like this. You go to the AWS Certificate Manager, and you can get an SSL or TLS certificate for your for your, your load balancers, your cloud front distributions, or your website. Last thing we'll say, you've got multiple options from the AWS Certificate Manager. You basically can use the standard AWS Certificate Manager, and this gives you um, SSL TLS certificates to be deployed in your public environment, your load balancers, your cloud front, your API gateways. That's typically how you would deploy it, simplest, most elegant way. Now, there are times where you want to deploy internal applications that are, say, HTTPS inside of your organization, like an intranet versus an intranet. In this case, you can go to the uh, AWS Certificate Manager, and you do get a private certificate. And when you're, what happens is you can get a certificate for your private systems to run SSL TLS in your internal systems. Private certificates cannot be used on the internet, and private certificates are available at an additional cost. So let's open the field for questions. We covered a lot of content. And after that, we'll go to costing. And you know what? We can probably finish up today um, if we keep track and stay no more than 10 minutes of questions now. So that way we can finish today and everybody can actually enjoy their Sunday. If needed, I'll be here for you because I want to make sure you guys get cloud hired. So hit the like button if you're happy. If you're enjoying the content, please share with others. Please like and subscribe and hit Cloud Hired if you're having fun. And if you've got questions, pop those questions in. And Chris from my team will help me find them. All right, so we've got some questions. Um, let me scroll back here. OK, here's the first one. Jamal, what non-AWS monitoring system that you recommend, Mike? So that is a really great question, Jamal. I am not a sysops person. I don't do maintenance and I don't do monitoring. So every time I design an architecture, I typically find an operations person from that team and say, what is it you're using? And is it working for you? Is it not working for you? If it's continuing to work for you, I consistently do that. But I am not, I am an architect. I don't do any operations or maintenance. And there are a lot of really great tools here. There are people that actually spe that specialize in network management and is a complete and total specialty. Cisco used to even have its own CCIE for it because it's something that most of us architects don't touch at all or, or we're pretty far away from. So I would say um, in this particular case, um, use what the organization is using. Or when you're doing this part of your architecture team, consult with the maintenance people, the SysOp people, because they're the people that do the monitoring and the maintenance.
Hey, Chris, you want to bring in the next one? It's on the screen. When to use IAM policies, permissions, inline policies, security group. Confused between those things. I think we answered your question because when I saw this question, that's when I said, would anybody like to do some security architecture? And when we did that, that's when we did the um, DDoS protection, the firewalls, the IDS, IPS systems, the network ACLs, the security groups. And we talked about where it all fit along the chain. Oop. I didn't mean to do that much. <laughs> There we go. Well, we are doing things live. Um, Alonzo, welcome back. Good to be back, Mike. How's everybody? Everybody is doing great. We're having a party. We've got about 30 more slides worth of content to go over. So we're going to finish today um, if we try really, really hard. I personally have a meeting that I have to get to today. So I'm good until about 3, 3.15. So right. the concept well, is either I'll stay on and do this, and we can have you do the lab in the end, or if we have time, we'll pop in a lab. I want to make sure everybody gets right. Sunday off and we get through this AWS Certified Solution Architect Associate Hybrid Professional <laughs> Certification slash Cloud Hired course that we're running this week. Stay All back. Right. Okay. Class. <laughs> we got we got several questions to get to, so I'm going to pop okay. you back in. Pop the them up. How can you integrate content delivery network and API gateway? It's not something I've ever done from an architecture perspective, so I can't answer that. You got to remember there's different things. There's what the cloud architects do, which is design. There's what cloud engineers do, which is this. Um, I am not a cloud engineer, so I don't do any system integration. I do the design and I hand it off to a cloud engineer. We architects are designers, engineers are builders, and they do that. I am a cloud infrastructure architect and not an application person. I am not a software developer in any way. I'm an architect. Static content does not need to, static content for websites can be served directly out of object storage. So there's no need to use an EC2 instance or an elastic load balancer for, for static content on the cloud. That's one of the ways their cloud native serverless environments is so beautiful. Stick it all in an S3 bucket or object storage. Pop a cloud front distribution. Bob's your uncle. You've got a website in 10 seconds and it's super scalable. How big is in the cache and the CDN? That's typically user settable, and every CDN is different. Because you want to bring on the next one? Yeah, you, you asked for a lot of cloud hires, so I'm having to go through them. Okay. <laughs> ah, yeah. There we go. Got to keep the algorithm. Happy. Plus, it's fun for me to know that people are out there. I really like to know people know that they're here. Minesh, can we use CloudWatch CloudTrail services for on-premise resources? Um, you can actually use CloudWatch for your on-premise services. There's an agent you can actually put on them. CloudTrail is more for your other stuff, but you can do some integration and some systems monitoring, especially in your hybrid and multi-cloud environments. The answer is yes. But if you're using other environments, you may find you there's a much better logging policy that you could potentially look into when you're dealing with four or five clouds. But yes, you can. And we should keep this related, related to AWS. Lenny, can we set an auto sync mechanism when there is a change in origin apart from the TTL, e.g. a push notification for a cache? And then I don't even understand the question you're asking here um, at all. So can you do an auto sync if there's a change in the origin apart from the TTL? Again, I still don't even know what you mean here. You could basically synchronize your S3 buckets and run two content up to, uh, and, and have your content delivery network across, synchronized across two buckets if you chose to do that, um, realistically speaking. Um, I don't really completely understand what you're asking here. So Chris, we need to move on to the next question. That's the last one related to the content. Um, here's one that's kind of a general question if you wanted to address it. Sure, what is it? It's uh, it's on the screen now. Um. Hi, greetings. You passed the solution architect exam, but in Virginia, all the recruiters are urging USA citizenships. You're a green heart, Troy. That's the biggest challenge. Any advice? So I will tell you, of the students I've had, 50% of them are on H-1B visas, and they get hired every time. Virginia is a very unique market that is completely different from the rest of the country. 
Virginia is pretty much only government work and nobody else is in Virginia. Virginia is one of the most expensive, most regulated cities in the world with some of these things. So nobody goes to Virginia unless they have to be. What goes to Virginia? I mean, I love Virginia. It's a nice place, but who's going to move their system to Virginia to one of the, with one of the most expensive areas in the country um, and run much higher data center costs, much higher personnel costs because of much higher housing costs, not many organizations. So start looking for things outside of Virginia. Virginia is predominantly U.S. government. U.S. government requires green card holders. H-1B visa holders have no problem finding a job in any other part of the country and look around for other places and remote jobs. You can get plenty of them, but Maryland, DC, Virginia, that area there is super expensive. And while they used to have in the rest of Virginia a point of presence, it's not an area where we're gonna find most of your non-government related data centers and government requires US citizenship. How do you provide security at the CDN? Well, like anything else, you start your DDoS protection there and your security doesn't go to the CDN, your security is at your data center. So you push your security like we showed you before, you have your, your uh, basically your content delivery network has some like kind of DDoS service like a Shield or Shield Advanced. Behind that, you've got a firewall, you've got an IDS IPS system, you've got a network ACL, you've got a security groove, you disable unnecessary servers on your host, you put host-based firewalls, anti-malware protection, and then you use IAM and of course encrypt the storage. That's the flow outside in. Of Anish, can we further encrypt decrypt certificates from an ACM? Could you suggest some tools to do it? Can you encrypt encrypted information? Of course, the answer. Um, but the question is why? So you could, if you really wanted security, you wouldn't really encrypt that encryption. What the encrypted certificate, what you could do is you could run an IPsec tunnel over HTTPS. Because when you actually look at HTTPS or SSL or SSH security versus IPsec, they're not even in comparison. Many years ago, we used to have these SSL TLS VPNs, and we stopped using them because they were inherently insecure compared to IPsec. So you could use HTTP, HTTPS, and then on top of that, you could create an IPsec tunnel. That you could definitely do, and organizations do do that. Chris, you want to bring in the next one? That's it. Okay, great. Let's get back to the content. And then uh, I know we've done labs every day this week. Alonzo's our lab person for the day. I'm going to get through the content, and ideally, Alonzo can do a lab with you guys. So now let's talk about um, improving costs. So, you know, the cloud is not necessarily cheaper. I'm going to say this again. The cloud could be cheaper. The cloud could be more expensive. It could be a lot more expensive, or it can be a lot cheaper. Don't let the... Uh, so all the uh, cloud's cheap, cloud's cheap. Hey, great. It's good to go from capital expense to operational expenses. It's a win. Every time I see someone say that, and we will definitely announce the contest winners down. Every time I hear someone say it's great to go from capital expenditures to operational expenditures, I know for a fact that person knows nothing about business and they know they can't be an architect. Capital expenditures are things that an organization purchases one time and they typically finance. Operational expenditures are ongoing expenses. Look at it this way. If you can purchase a product, that's capital expense. And if you finance that, if your weighted average cost of capital is 2%, which is the interest you're paying, that weighted average cost of capital financing may be substantially cheaper than the operational expenditures of renting equipment on the cloud. So it might be cheaper for an organization that has cash to just buy it completely instead of paying. So is the cloud cheaper? Maybe, maybe not. It's a matter of the use cases, the patterns of behavior. And that's the difference between an architect knowing what to do and when to do it versus a robot that took a certification course that was taught, this is what's going to work. So I want you guys to be architects. You got to understand that. So for most organizations, not all, most going from the network and the data center that's private to the cloud is cheaper overall. Most, not all. So please understand that. Now, when you're in a data center, what are organizations paying for? Servers, routers, switches, firewalls, load balancers, racks, 
power, power distribution units, UPSs, generators, transformers, data center cooling. And while that's a lot of things on real estate, that's where the main costs are in a data center. Now we still have operational expenses. What are they? We've got a pretty big staff to manage the stuff. Electric bills, WAN connections, that's really our cost. That's our operational cost. They're just the connections for the most part in our electric. But most costs are for equipment in a traditional data center. And it may be cheaper to buy the equipment and run it on your own than rent your equipment from the cloud if you use your equipment a lot. But it also might be cheaper on the cloud. And it's up to you as the architect to evaluate the organization's data use, how they're using it, and what's best for them. So you, people ask me, how do I convince people to go to the cloud? And I say, I don't convince people to do anything. I evaluate the organization systems. What are the current? What is the ultimate state? How do we best benefit the customer? Then I design something with a technoc to do it. And then I do an ROI model. The cost of this equipment versus what does it take to actually, what are we doing to the business? I evaluate that on a hybrid cloud, data center only, multi-cloud and or a single cloud environment and from there i can design a system but only until we do that do we have any information beyond that it's all hype it's all fluff and it's all meaningless um, by providers that are saying hey we're cheaper we're better faster we're cheaper maybe they are maybe they're not but it's up to you the architect to know when and how to design it hybrid cloud multi-cloud no cloud all clouds all of it that's up to you guys so generally speaking because with cloud computing, there's minimal instance to purchase, it is really great for a startup. Nothing to purchase. Startups have limited funding. Cloud is awesome. Now, with the cloud, you're paying as you're using the data. So the ongoing cost of the cloud could be a lot higher than the cost of just purchasing equipment or a lot cheaper based upon a use case and understand that. With the cloud, there's very minimal capital costs. There's almost nothing to buy. But the operational costs on the cloud are sky high, sky high. So which is cheaper long term? I don't know. It's different on every architecture I design. And I must run this ROI model every time. I'm not a robot. I'm an architect. I need to know what my customers want everywhere, every time. So if people say, how do you convince people? I say, I do an ROI model. I evaluate what's best in the customers, and then I show them. But I don't pick something ahead of time because I don't know until I run the business case for every single customer. So how do you keep costs under control? Well, for one thing, only buy what you need. So don't buy more. Obvious, right? Now monitor your systems. How are you going to know what you need until you monitor them? If you've got a 120 core server with four terabytes of DRAM and it's running at 80%, you can't shrink that thing. If you have a 120 core server with four terabytes of DRAM and it's operating at 3% memory and 3% CPU, shrink that and add more of them in an auto scaling group. It'll be cheaper. So properly size your resources, but you can't properly size your resources until you know what you actually need. So size your equipment on the cloud based upon average uses. This is awesome. In the data center, you size upon max uses. Why? In a data center, you build your web servers for maybe the Christmas season when it's busiest. On the cloud, you can build it for every day of the year and use auto scaling to scale out when needed. So cloud, big thing, purchase upon average use. Data center purchase upon peak use. That in and of itself may be enough to make the cloud more inexpensive. Now, when you're doing these architectures in the cloud, decouple them everywhere. Use content delivery networks. Use SQS queuing. Anything you can do to basically decouple things, make them scale independently to keep your costs under control. The next way to keep your cost optimized on the cloud or to use the right platform. If you know your traffic and it's predictable, use reserve compete instances, reserve virtual machines. Why? You get a discount for committing to them for one year or three years. If you don't know, use on-demand instances or use a combination. Reserve your baseline capacity and use on-demand for auto-scaling. It'll, it'll be cheaper and you'll always scale. And if you've got work, and we talked about spot instances, that is not critical, that can be run F hours, and you can get away with starts and stops, you can use spot instances or basically bid for reserve capacity. For most customers, the best cost estimation is going to be use a combination of using reserved instances on demand and spot instances when appropriate. 
What else can you do to keep your cost low? Well, you can leverage managed services and serverless. Serverless could be cheaper. You can manage your data transfer costs, maybe with S3 cross-region replication or using CloudFront to serve locally. Because remember, also, if you've got a lot of data coming in and out of your network, it could be cheaper to use a direct connection versus a VPN. Because remember, AWS is charging for the data transfer costs. So you've got to evaluate on every single question. One thing that I will tell you is, uh, generally speaking, it's good to know you're ahead of your time. So I suggest setting up a budget. Here's how the budget works. Basically, you select the budget and create it. And then basically what will happen is AWS will monitor your usage against the budget, and they will send you alert when you get close to using it. Strongly recommend. We had Alonzo teach everybody how to set up a bucket, uh, I mean, a, a budget on the first day for this reason. The last service we'll talk about is an automated AWS service. Let's be fair. What we're talking about here is as follows. They call it Trusted Advisor. And now you've got a tool that's going to go through all your systems. It's going to analyze your systems and make recommendations. Again, it's a tool. Tools are not humans. So uh, for those of you that have worked on Linux and you know there's errors every minute, and it's like, okay, don't worry about an error. Worry about this instead. Well, you know, tools generate a lot of this. So Trusted Advisor is an AWS service. It monitors what you're doing compared to best practices, and it makes recommendations. Again, lovely tool, but it's a tool. So if you're on the basic plan or developer support plan, you get six security checks and 50 service limit checks with Trusted Advisor. If you're on a business support plan or enterprise support plan, you'll get a lot more. You'll get 115 Trusted Advisor checks of which 14 are cost optimization, 17 are security, 24 are fault tolerance, 10 are performance, and 50 are server limits. Okay, so we were pretty basic for that. Um, we see if there's any questions, then we're gonna talk about building high availability systems. We discussed it throughout the thing. And then at that point, I'm gonna have Alonzo do a lab with you. And then we're gonna announce the winners to our contest. And then after that, what we will do is we will have Alonzo do a lab and we will finish up today around 3, 3.15. And that way you guys can all have a, a free Sunday. So if you're enjoying the content, please hit the like button, um, inform others. And uh, I'm not sure if I see any new questions here. Yes, there's there's a couple. Um, okay, bring, bring them up. One, one not related to the content. So I'll, let, I'll bring it up for you to, to address if you want to. Sure. If I can, I will. It's on the screen. It's on the screen. Okay, Evans. So, Yasin Khan, what what is the primary criteria for choosing cloud vendors? I also provide some content. How to go vendor neutral? I always am vendor neutral. Here's the thing about vendor neutral. You don't pick a vendor. You speak to your customer and you find out what's in the best interest of the customer. That's what an architect should do every single time. So I never think of vendors. I think about what solves my customer problems. So I want you to think about, you know, the vendors, the characteristics of the vendors. Who does what? What is Google's business? Google's business is search and advertising and content. So what is search? Search is a machine learning artificial intelligence algorithm. Google is the number one and number two player in search. That's what they do. That's their business. They're basically a $2 trillion company or near that doing search. So when I think about who's going to have the best uh, machine learning tools that are pre-built or libraries, it's going to go Google. I'm going to think about that all the time. I'm then going to think about who's got the best infrastructure and the most infrastructure. That's probably AWS right now. So if I need a lot of big servers, lots of infrastructure, I might think AWS. No. If I think business friendliness and no one caring about the kind of messages that an organization is sending, I might think Microsoft. Microsoft's got some of the best strategic business advisors in the world. So I kind of look at it from a perspective of, you know, who am I specializing in? So I always use two clouds. I will never use a single cloud. It's typically AWS and Azure, or it is an OpenStack cloud at the data center, 
plus AWS or Azure or a Nutanix cloud plus AWS or Azure. So really figure out what the business needs most. Then figure out which store or which cloud provider actually offers the best service. And that is how you choose based upon nothing other than what's in your customer's best interest. Chris, you can bring up the next one. Rita L. Is it possible to automate I IAM? Well, you wouldn't want to. Um, IAM is determining you know, who can access what system and what time. So if you automated it in the wrong way, you can basically violate your last line of defense for security. So there's things that you can semi-automate, like adding groups and adding users to groups, and there's ways that you can potentially do certain things. But instead of automation, they could have probably wanted to know that they, they may have probably been asking you, could you federate to another environment to pull and use their AWS things? Because you know, I don't want to automate ever you logging in without me checking you. But I don't want to be adding users and groups um, to an organization's to AWS, but I could pull them from an organization's Active Directory. So basically speaking, federated identity is how you would smooth and simplify the process. Anish, can you migrate data dump kept in S3.3 to document DB? Um, I'm not even going to know where to begin with that, Ashish, um, Ashish um, because that's a big data architect. So Praveen, big data architect for my team's done nothing other than data architectures for 20 years. On Friday, you can ask him that, but this is way, way, way outside of a certified solution architect associate, professional Azure expert equivalent course. And it's also way outside of anything that a cloud architect would do. This is something for a cloud data architect to do. So we have one of them coming in on Friday. That's it. Okay, cool. Then let's do this. Let's talk about a little bit about high availability, and we discussed it in depth. What is availability? Availability refers to systems being available when you need them. Now, everybody's got a different level of high availability. My definition of high availability is greater than 99.999% of the time. That's what customers demand with me. AWS calls high availability 99.99%. You can get my to let my level of five nines availability on the cloud. It's real hard to do in the cloud. And guess what? It's relatively hard to do in the data center. There are those of us in the world that have done this. And we're typically CCIEs with lots of experience because it's really involved redundancy everywhere. So, most organizations would consider 99.99% available to be high availability. And you can do that with a cloud by using two data centers, two availability zones. So for most organizations, high availability means deploying your applications across two availability zones for most, but not all. If you're an internet service provider, that's not enough. You can't have an hour downtime per year for your business customers. If you're a bank and your systems are down, you've got problems. If you're a hospital and your systems are down an hour a year, people will die. So you cannot get away with 99.99% availability for high performance, high availability systems. You need better. So if you're gonna do that on the cloud, you will have to use multiple availability zones in multiple regions. So kind of hard to do it on the cloud, but you can. Now let's look at what these availability levels mean. 99% available, meaning 3.65 days of downtime. 99.9, .9. not good. Three nines availability, almost nine hours of downtime per year. AWS definition of high availability is 99.99% of the time, meaning two availability zones. This means 52.6 minutes of downtime per year. If you do that in a bank, the bank could lose billions. If you do that in a hospital, people will die. So that is not high availability. High availability is greater than 99.999% of the time for critical environments. Verizon, AT&T, Bank of America, JP Morgan Chase, any kind of hospital you're talking about, a Kaiser Permanente, New York Presbyterian. The, I'm picking up big global healthcare or big healthcare organizations, big banks out of examples. There's lots of other examples I can give you. Four nines is not enough for these kind of facilities. They need 99.99. Why? Because you walk into a major hospital like New York Presbyterian and the systems aren't down, someone could die. 
if you're trying if you're a bank or like a big bank and they're trying to place trades and they can't place a trade they could be losing millions of dollars per second so high availability for many organizations is 99.99 like aws specifies 52.6 minutes of downtime per year to availability zones but if you need more and most of the people i work with need more they need five nines which is 10 times greater availability than we're talking about here with aws you're going to have to have your systems delayed in two regions and two availability zones per region or better yet two availability zones in aws two availability zones in azure aws goes down azure still up azure goes down aws is still up don't put all your eggs in one basket we would never use two in two wan connections from verizon we would use an at t one and a verizon one you want to know if your carrier or service provider or cloud provider goes down you're still up so better yet Two availability zones, instead of, if you wanted to create a five nines network on AWS, you could use two regions and two availability zones per region. Or better yet, use uh, Azure two availability zones and the other two in AWS. Now you've got four, just like before, across two providers. So you've got much more survivability. When it comes to availability, one is none, two is one, and three is greater than two. Let's talk more. Building a high availability network is based upon the following tenets. No single points of power. This means redundant power, redundant cooling, redundant network connections, redundant routers, redundant switches, redundant servers, redundant cards in your routers, redundant power supplies in your router, redundant servers, redundant load balancers, redundant TNS, redundant storage, and redundant databases. This is how you build high availability. Now, generally speaking, it's a lot easier on the cloud. Why? because you don't have to figure out the redundant power going to the data center. You don't have to think about, um, realistically speaking, redundant cooling. You don't have to think about redundant internet connections across the internet. You don't have to, because they do it all. They've got all the redundancy built in, so it makes it so much easier. They've got redundant routers, switches, all the work that people like me have been trained, you know, thousands of hours of training to build high availability systems. AWS does a lot of that for you, so it makes it a lot easier. So best practices, spread your load across multi-AZs. Two AZs gets you to 99.99% available. If you need more than that, use multi-region and multi-AZ per region, or better yet, multi-cloud. Anything that needs a high availability at minimum should be in multiple AZs whether they be virtual machines or EC2 compute instances, databases, load balancers, DNS, everything two regions. I mean, two availability zones minimum. Redundant network connections. So if you've got two links to AWS, if you've got a 100 gig direct connection, back it up with a 100 gig direct connection. If you've got a one gig connection, you might be able to get away with backing it up with a one gig VPN. If you have 40 gigs, four 10 gig connections bundled in a link aggregation group, chances are you're going to need to have four 10 gig connections bundled in another link aggregation group across another service provider. One connection on AT&T, one connection on NTT, one connection on Verizon, another correction on NTT or AT&T. It doesn't matter. Redundant everything across other organizations. So most people will get away with a redundant direct connection, a direct connection and a VPN backup, but not all. So, Let's look at the two architectures for connecting to the cloud that you'll probably deal with. Architecture one is this. You have a direct connection, which is your primary connection, and you've got a VPN backup. Widely, widely used in common. But let's say you can't survive on the latency of a VPN. You can have a redundant direct connection or, re or multiple connections. Now, the only thing I'm going to say to you is this. AWS will tell you that this router is highly available and it is because it's a logical router not a physical router and they would say you can use a single router on your end and it's high availability because it builds you connections to two availability zones i'm going to tell you this no <laughs> if you their if their render is highly available and you only have one router here that's highly available if your router dies here your connectivity to the cloud is gone so in high availability design, you use redundant routers, 
redundant connections to redundant routers on both sides. That's how you do it. One is none, two is one, and three is greater than two when it comes to availability. Now, when you're designing for high availability, if you get hacked, your systems are down. So I strongly recommend building high availability into your systems. Use that principle of least privilege we talked about. Disable unnecessary servers on all your services. Regularly patch your systems with security updates. Limit the blast radius, meaning what can happen in one part of your organization to another by using things like AWS organizations, way out of scope of this course. Um, we want to keep unwanted traffic out of subnets using network ACLs, keep unwanted traffic out of our servers, the security groups. We're going to use firewalls, IDS, IP systems. We're going to use DDoS protection, those kind of things. We're going to have physical security, protecting the routers that connect to the cloud. We're going to use strong password when passwords needed, and we're going to template known good configurations whenever possible and deploy them with something like Terraform or CloudFormation. The next part of high availability system design is backups. If you, if you don't back up your systems, your machine images, and you lose them, you lost them. Your data, you should be backed up at all times. Create images of your production servers, backup in at least one remote and secure location. Increase your availability, add auto scaling. Look at it this way. If your systems are up, if your web server can handle 10,000 requests per second, and you get a DDoS attack at 15,000 web requests per second, but your web server can scale up to be able to handle 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 requests by scaling out, guess what? You'll still be able to serve your customers while you're dealing with the DDoS attack. Also, if you get a lot more demand than you had compute supply, then the auto scaling will fix you. So that will help improve performance and availability. Decouple your application architecture so the problems that occur in one area don't affect another. Use caching to reduce load on your servers. Use DNS to load balance across availability zones or regions or cloud providers. Use load balancers to eliminate single points of failure. Watch your system, see what's going on. Monitor for systems alerts, monitor for security breaches. monitor for usages. Change your passwords periodically and make sure you do change management. If anybody doesn't know, um, change management. I know they don't know, know high availability system. Here's what change management is. Prior to making any change in any port of an organization's environment, here's the thing you actually do. You notify all the stakeholders. By notifying all of the stakeholders, here's what you do. You make sure that they know to tell you, no, don't do this at this time, or they may have to prep their systems. For example, if somebody's running a batch job and you make a change that breaks the batch job, and it's a critical batch job that takes 40 hours to complete over the weekend, and you broke the system, then basically you may have hurt the business. So ask all stakeholders before you do it. All stakeholders have to agree on a change at the time. So that's how you design high availability systems. Now, we're going to do a lab after this, but I want to talk just a little bit about passing the exam. All AWS exams are hard. Here's the reason they're hard. The way the questions are written are really, really wordy. Really, really wordy. There's always a winning answer, but there may be multiple answers which are also good. So you really got to think like AWS on this exam. How do they think? What's their brand? What is the way they want you to do it? So when you take these exams, if you're not experienced, they're going to be very easy for you because all you're going to know is what's been taught in a course and you practice exams and you're going to be good. If you are very experienced and you know 10 ways to do say the same things, these exams are going to be challenging because the Amazon way may be slightly different than the Microsoft way versus the Cisco way versus the Google way. And if you know all the ways that everybody else does it, these exams are harder because Amazon exams want you to do it the Amazon way. So my suggestion is whenever you take an exam, any company, Evaluate what it is the way they want you to say it, and those are your answers. So, what else do I recommend? I recommend to you know watch this entire thing, read all the diagram, read the book, look at the diagrams in the book, read the AWS white papers, and take a practice test. Where would I get a practice test? I happen to know Haman Sharma. He's the CEO of uh, Review and Prep. I love his practice exams. I know Haman Sharma. He's a really great person. He runs a classy organization run by good people. I can recommend review and prep for practice exams. 
I recommend working on a practice exam until you can score a 95 or better every single time, and then you're ready to take an exam because I want you to know and I want you to pass. I'm also going to recommend this. For more good certification content, I recommend that you go to Andrew Brown from Exam Pro. He's got a completely free AWS Certified Solution Architect 2020 class, and he's reducing a more modern one soon. His class is focused on certifications. Ours is more about architecture. Combine his, combine ours, and you have the perfect certification solution, all free, completely free. Follow that up with a practice exam from Haman Sharma. His prices are good. They're very reasonable. We have no financial um, relationship with Haman Sharma at all, but I like to be able to give you guys the people that I like the best. I think I also, on the YouTube community tab, have a 15% coupon for you guys. You can use it. I asked Haman for, somebody, for something to make it a little cheaper for my students, and he agreed he's a really good guy. Again, we get no financial transaction with that. I just want to align you with the best resources I can because I want you to be perfect. Now, when you take these exams the day before, get a good night's sleep, eat healthy, avoid alcohol or anything like that. Here's the thing. The hardest part of the exam is reading these questions. The content in the exams is not complicated, but the questions and the way they're asked is very challenging. So don't be tired. I want you being calm. Why do I want you being calm? When we're calm, we're using our happy prefrontal cortexes, logical reasoning, good. When we get uncalm, the prefrontal cortex shuts down, the amygdala kicks in, we get very stupid. That's why when you're in an argument and you say things to somebody, you regret them for your, forever because you say really stupid things. When you're stressed, we get dumb. So be calm. In order to be calm, make sure you know how to get to the location the day before. Show up 30 minutes early so that if there's traffic, you're not there. If you're online, be prepared 30 minutes early anyway. If you've ever taken any of these exams and your computer froze along the way or has trouble getting them set up, I promise you things go wrong. Gives yourselves time. Remember, you can run into parking problems. You can run into tech problems. You can run into traffic problems. Just don't be there late. Make it as easy as possible. And remember that you need to bring a photo ID when you take these exams. So... Let's do the following. I will take questions and uh, we will announce the winners of our contest in a few moments. And then Alonzo will do a lab with you guys that desire because I'd love you guys to get one more lab. I just have to finish up at around 3.15 today. So are there any questions for me right now? Yes. Okay. Uh, somebody, uh, somebody asked if you could speak... Uh, Speak more about the uh, about RTO and RPO. So recovery time and recovery point. Yeah. So when you're dealing with uh, disaster recovery, you know it's how long till you're up. Recovery time objective and recovery point objective. How old is your data that's going to be backed up? So the best way I can describe it is this: if you can be up up in one minute, that's your return time objective. But if the data that you have is one day old, that's your recovery point objective. So you have to figure out how much data an organization can actually live with of that's lost, and that's your recovery time objective. And then uh, you could go over the durability concept again. Durability means, so, so here's the difference between availability and durability. Availability means your systems are going to be there when you need them. Durability means will your information be there? So let's say you've got... Um, but S3 durability, which is 99.99% of the time. That's great. I mean, S3 availability, which is 99.99. That means that with the exception of 52 minutes a year, you'll be able to access your data. Now, durability means that the chances of your data getting destroyed. So meaning that 11 nines means that your data will be, the, the degree that your data is protected from being destroyed or lost is 99. Nine, 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 nine percent of the time, your data won't be lost. So basically, it means if you store your data on the cloud, it's going to be permanently available until you delete it because it's always going to be there. That's what durability means. Um, then uh, someone asked if there's, if you're using multi cloud, is there a central management tool for, uh, for monitoring and things like that? For deployment, people use Terraform. There's lots of monitoring tools that are out there in the industry. As I mentioned, I am not a sysop professional, and there are lots and lots of tools that sysop professionals actually use, but I'm an architect, not a maintenance person. And since I'm not a maintenance person, I don't specialize in monitoring systems. 
Um, AWS restart that will not cover what's sufficient to get hired in the cloud, but it will be, it will give you some additional competency, which is great. Anytime you can get additional training, we think it's great. Remember that you have to figure out the career you want. As architects, we're system designers, and we system designers do the following: we design end-to-end -end systems. All of the training that's out there covers the system configuration, so. It will be helpful to get a junior implementation engineer job, like a junior cloud engineer. It will be helpful for the maintenance people like the sysops, but for the bigger jobs like the architects, it will not be helpful. But it would still be helpful to give you additional information. So it'll always be helpful, but uh, your, your focus needs to be, um, what are the systems in the network and the data center? Because those are the things that are going to the cloud, not how to configure a service, what you're moving to be an architect. Now, if your whole goal is to be a cloud engineer and you just want to configure things all day, the AWS training is great. Um, so here we go. I'll, I'll post the link for this day. If you see the question. Can we, okay, so can we talk about VPC, please, or virtual private cloud? Yes, we actually covered the VPC in extreme depth. Which day did we do that, Chris? I'm not sure, but I'm going to post the link. I'm going through them right now. We'll post the link for that. To really talk about the VPC, I could talk about it for about four weeks straight as a cloud network architect like me. We spent a, at least two hours on the VPC, Virginia, before, and I don't think I can really give it you what you need in less than those two hours. So Chris from my team will do that. We'll give you a link to that one. I would love to answer it otherwise, but it's too big of a topic. Yep. And that's it. I believe okay. that was Thursday for VPC. Say this one more time. I believe I want to say uh, Thursday was the day that we talked about VPC and provided a lab for everyone. Yeah, I'll, I'll put the link in there. <clears throat> okay, so the next thing on uh, before Chris does before Chris does this, we ran a contest this week for which we're going to give two free tickets to the AWS Certified Solution Architect. For I'm, I'm sorry, to two to a two free courses to two lucky winners to our cloud architect career development program, a program that's designed to basically take people and turn them into hired cloud architects where we train them. They do live classes twice per week with us. And we really design cloud architectures during two live sessions. In addition to the two live three hour sessions that we do of which, you know, it's on zoom. So students ask questions. We design architectures for 40,000 remote locations. Um, we deal with kind of environments with hundreds of thousands of subnets. We deal with environments of hundreds of thousands of servers. My students are the best in the world. One of the main cloud providers even sent a director from one of the business units to tell my students how much they love them. Um, that happened on June 18. It was from one of the biggest cloud providers. So we'll give you, so and what we'll do is following is we're going to do this. We are going to announce the winners. One of the winners is Daniel Basu. Um, he's winner number one. The next winner is Ryan Perez. Congratulations to you guys. We will see you starting next week in our class. You will be doing our three-hour architecture training twice per week. You will then have pro pro program pro projects to do during the week. You will be building career plans. We will be building resumes with you. We will help you by with interview tactics, interview techniques, salary negotiation. And we will, of course, cover this so you will be able to work on every cloud provider AWS is only one part of it. Congratulations to you, Daniel Bastu and Ryan Perez. You guys did an amazing. Daniel not only was here the whole week, but he promoted it, promoted it, and promoted it. And when I saw Ryan Perez's video that he created and my team saw it, we were blown away. So thank you, you two. For those of you that were not, that attended this week, that participated in, I am going to have Chris do what we never do and send a 25% coupon off to our entire mailing list for our Cloud Architect Career Development Program. You will be able to use it. You can register for our program. You can select the payment plan, and it will be 25% off for everybody on this session. And for the people that participated, we will do this, which we've never done, a 30% off coupon for the people that participated in the contest. And they will be distributed very soon. So Chris will send an email to our entire mailing list with a 25% off coupon code to celebrate all of you that participated this week and 30% off to the people that participated, but the two lucky winners are there. Um, Chris, so, my team, make that happen in the next few days. 
Um, so we've got some people ask us to share Ryan's video. So what I'll do is from the uh, business page, I'll share the post from both of the winners so that they, so that everybody can see the ones that, that won. Sounds good. And Daniels was persistent. He yeah. He posted multiple times <laughs> and he commented on every, everybody else's post. That was what it realistically took. We announced the contest. We emailed the contest, you know, we periodically run them, but if you'd like to really get hired, we'd love you to be part of our Cloud Architect Career Development Program. Chris, please post a link to that course. While we're at it, post the coupon. And if anybody's got any questions about our course or our real Cloud Architect training, let us know. If you guys want to know some more, we'd love to hear from you. So any further questions from me? I know there were some questions on how to register, so make sure we add that registration link and a coupon code click. Abigail um, Marks, we don't run contests very often. Um, we don't do it for the following reason. There's extreme demand for our training and we, we charge about 5% of what we're supposed to charge for our course. So we don't do a lot of free contests, but you know, we had run into a situation where we decided to run a contest. Um, so we ran this contest and, you know, we love to run them when we can, but you know, we probably yeah. won't be running anytime soon. And a couple of people are saying they weren't aware that there was a contest. So the best way to be aware of it in the future is make sure you follow and subscribe all of our social media, not just YouTube. So we, um, we, we, we announce these things on social media and our email campaigns. So if you're following all of our platforms, you'll probably, you should across one of them, see the contest in the future. So. so Chris, if you uh, put uh, if you put uh, the link to our course and you know this one time we can add the twenty five percent off coupon code, we'll make yes, sure. Yes, I don't, I don't, I don't have the twenty five percent coupon. Okay. Code, well, so I will, yeah. I will, I will, I will text you one right now. Um, there's one that I made up the other day. Um, let me send that to you right now. I'm going to Slack send it over to you via Slack. And that way you can cut and paste it directly in. Let me figure out how to do this. I'm so glad you guys made me move from LinkedIn groups to Slack. I love LinkedIn. You should have that. Any questions for me while... Uh, while well, uh, you're ready to go. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Mike. <laughs> let, let's finish this and we'll let Alonzo do a, do a, do a lab. I love Alonzo doing lab. Alonzo is a great cloud architect. He's got some good cloud engineering skills and he's a close friend. So we've got people that want to do labs. We've got Abbott, we've got Alonzo here and you know, let's spread the load to anybody that desires it. All we want to do at Go Cloud Careers, Go Cloud Architects is give everybody the best careers in cloud computing or networking careers we can. So let's do what we can to help this beautiful community. And Abu Nasser, every time we do an architecture, we do it on AWS, Azure, Google, OpenStack, Nutanix. So every time we work across every cloud, so Abu Nasser, there's no such thing as just AWS to us. We are cloud agnostic. We train cloud architects, not solution architects. A cloud architect can work on any cloud, anywhere, anytime. A solution architect only knows Azure. We train people to work on all platforms because that's the job. Hand of God, you can't believe your eyes with what you've seen <laughs> us post in the last few days. Such a great man and team. Thank you so much. I'm so humbled by that. I'm happy to provide cover fire for you anytime, anywhere. Um, thank you so much. Um, obviously, you and I have a similar background. And you know anybody that's got my six, I've got your six as well. And I'm so glad we were able to help. Um, thank you so much. Look forward to working with you, Albert Nasser. I think you're going to have an incredibly great time. Yeah, indeed. You're going to have a good time. You're going to learn so much. I really like that, you know, people take my course after the first week. They say, I learned more in the first week than I have in the last year by doing all these other things. And that's how we know our, our message is on point. Okay, Alonzo. Why don't you take it away and do one last lab with everyone so we can celebrate working on tech, playing with tech. If you guys love it, um, 
Um, yeah, we can get you out of database programming and stop you <laughs> into cloud architecture like yeah. nothing. My last great database person, we had a cloud architect job within, uh, literally speaking, two months. Um, and he's going to be talking to you guys next Friday, and he's really great. So really welcome that. Okay, well, what we are going to be doing today, we're going to be in the kitchen working on DNS. We're going to be working on setting an A record, and we're already going to have a connected EC2, and we're going to attach uh, an Apache server on top of that, and we're going to point that DNS record to that particular area, and we're going to ping for it. So if you're ready to go, we are about to... Uh, take off and uh, do this lab. So I'm going to share my screen and let me know if everyone can see it. I'm sure Chris, um, let me know if, if it's big enough for everyone to see. If not, then I'll increase. Can everyone see that? Yeah, but you're muted. It seems like you're muted, Alonzo. Okay, can everyone see me and hear me? Yes. Okay, okay, great. Okay, okay, well, we are headed to our AWS management console. This is where the magic is going to happen. This is where we've been all week and focusing on EC2s, uh, creating a uh, VPC environment for our resources, S3s, um, even touch base on databases. So today is going to be a quick focus on Route 53. So I spent a little time last night playing around, um, uh, focusing on on uh, things like A records, uh, quadruple A A A A A records, C name records, M X M X records, and N S name service records, and thought that um, it would be really cool to just focus on one of them because a lot of this stuff takes a long time to propagate, like 24 hours. So I wanted to keep it simple. I wanted to keep it uh, focused on just an A record. So now remember that an A record, basically it's um, it determines which IP address belongs to a domain name. So with that being said, what we're going to do is go to our Route 53 dashboard. Now, as you can see, we have a lot of different things that we can focus on. We have our DNS management, our availability monitoring, our readiness check, traffic management, domain registry, and routing control. So let's go over here to domain registry. Now, what I did was, uh, what you can do is that you can register a domain and you can pick and choose what you already, you can pick and choose whatever specific domain that you're looking for, for every particular website. Um, on average, a .com is going to probably be about $12. So you can go and check. Um, so what I did was um, I already pre-made one, um, but I'm just going to go through the, um, just say, for instance, XYZ-OV2, something pretty random um, that we can check. So we can see that that domain is available and we can add it to our cart. And then we can continue. And this is the point where we can add all our registrate, uh, registering contact information on where we want to uh, uh, pay for everything. But at this point in time, I, I came up with a cool little name, Living Out Cloud, a cool little name um, for this fictitious website um, that I wanted to put together. So. What I did is that um, based on that routing information, um, I spun it up. And now I have um, a focus on our hosted zones. So initially you have your NS and your SOA records right here. And these particular um, servers are the ones where they're going to uh, be bouncing um, off and on through the servers to create um, the DNS records that are needed. So for this particular one, again, um, I created a simple A record. Now, remember again that 
um, an A record determines which IP address uh, belongs to a domain name, specifically an IP4. So what I did was, <clears throat> excuse me, what I did was I created that record. And now you can see the, um, the name is Living Out Cloud. It's an A-type record. Our value is um, what our IP address is, IP address is right here. And then we had set um, we had set a time to live, basically a ping for 300 seconds. If it does not, um, if it if it can't be heard in um, three 300 seconds, then it's considered unhealthy. So I'm going to go to my um, command line interface. And right here, I've already created an Ubuntu um, uh, virtual machine already so that we can add our Apache uh, web server to. So I'm going to put in that information now so that we can get the Ubuntu um, Apache service going. Okay, it's going, it's going. Okay, wonderful. Now we're upgraded. Oops. I just got to watch the spelling. The details matter. So now it's booting up, it's packaging and getting everything going. Sometimes it takes a little while, but it's at two, uh, 98%. So just waiting for that other 2% and we can move forward. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so now what I can do right now is that now that I've um, added on Apache, which is sitting on the Ubuntu, now I can search for uh, my, I can ping for my particular um, web, uh, web domain based on my IP address. So there we go. If you remember right here, we have our A record, our simple routing, and our 3.142.48.163. Uh, and that's our A record right here. So what I can do right now is that I can uh, grab this value and we should be at a point where I can find my, um, uh, my Apache server. Sometimes it takes a while. Let me double check my routes and make sure everything is okay. Put my hosted zone. Good to go. We're good to go. And the request. Okay. Okay, let's take a look at this one more time. Okay. All right, one more thing we got to check. Okay. 
let's try it one more time here. A fresh record. Might be missing a step. It's always about focusing on making sure that you have all your steps available. So, uh, Alonso, we got a couple of comments from uh, yes. other, people, other people on the program with you. Um, Shinton uh, suggests uh, making sure Apache is running, and then Leo uh, says after installing Apache, is it needed to start and enable the web server that's right that's right thanks so much guys and of course they're in the program with you of course they're gonna... <laughs> right yeah. right so let me go ahead and uh, get that squared away Double check to make sure I have everything that's running. This is what I love about live sessions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, get to, you, get to see, you get to see the behind the scenes beauty of everything that we do. It's like uh, everybody, Google, go to Google, go to Overstack, go to. Exactly, <laughs> going to all these places. It doesn't matter what field you're in. It's like, did you Google the answer? <laughs> no, I'm missing something. Okay. I started the pat I started Apache. My Ubuntu was kicking. Pseudo app updates. I installed Apache. I'm ready to go. I should be, let me see. Um, Umang, uh, another person from the program, put a, uh, looks like he put a code uh, in the chat box. I'm not sure what that code okay. does. Let's give it a try. Give it a check. So you I can't know... copy. You can't copy. And... Oh, you can. I can't because I'm the host. I forgot. <laughs> I remember. That's why. I'll... Okay. Authentication required to start Apache. Uh... Okay. I should be able to do this. I just did it. All right, interesting. All right, let's try this one more time. That's why we are here as a community to get this thing right. Okay, based on that. Okay. I will get this done because I just did it earlier <laughs> today. <laughs> oh my goodness. Where are my, where's my information here? And this is where you add in, I, I, I'm a cloud architect, I don't configure. Right. <laughs> this is exactly I, I I am not a command line man. I was the first to admit. So let's try this. Okay. So I know my answer is in here somewhere. Okay, so let's Take a look in our records and in our information. Make sure our hosted zones are everything that it needs to be. Do details. Okay. Record name. 
three. Let's try this one more time. Somewhere it's not connecting. This is connect. Everything's good. Everything's good here. So, is there other than this uh, lab? Did you have anything else that we were going to cover? Uh, no, no. This okay. was it. It okay. was my focus was to connect. Uh, we already added Ubuntu um, as a virtual machine and added Apache on top of that, and then we were going to make sure that we could connect. Um, and show the uh, um, Apache um, default page. So that is what I'm working on. Gotcha. Outside of that. Okay. Registration. Zones. All right, let's get back to our Apache overview. Back on to, let's go and do this again. is installed so now Okay, We're, the record is there. So now, where is our, I know I'm missing a step here. Just gotta remember what it is. Typically speaking, you gotta reset the service. Okay. And I just, I had uh, updated I had added and updated the server, so now I'm at a point where Apache is installed. So now I'm just trying to um, make sure that I can show the uh, default Apache page. Hmm. Okay. I would just restart the service, Alonzo. Yeah. Um, it's in Slack. Okay. Yeah, he, did, he just put it in there. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's try this one more time. The only problem is when did you set this up, Alonzo? I had set it up earlier today, and I was kind of concerned because it usually well, it's not. It may not have time to propagate throughout all exactly. the DNS servers throughout the world. So typically speaking, when you set this up, it can take 24 hours or more for everybody to know about it. So right. realistically yeah. speaking, what you really want to do is you want to see if that web server is actually up. You know, you can check a status of it, see what's going on in the server. Um, be at top, you'll be able to see if Apache is running. And, you know, that's, the, that's what happens when we architects actually do configuration things because that's not really what we do, especially yeah. doing Linux admin work. But, you know, I know you know how to do it. I know you've done it many times. Yes, you know, yes. Check the status of that. Do a top. See if you see it running. See if it's using CPU performance. But remember, for, for all of us, you know, you built this server. You just set up a DNS thing. It's got to propagate the DNS servers throughout the world. So obviously, he restarted the service. The service of Apache Two. He's he's done that. Um, but I appreciate the uh, the Linux Unix commands because definitely needed to do it. He definitely did do it. 
Alright. And I checked my uh, security group. So, yeah, because I was able to SSH into Ubuntu. Um, let me try something else. Sure. Funny, we were doing this with a great DevOps engineer. He was doing a great DevOps demo. And I was like, these things just happen when you do things. But realistically speaking, <laughs> If you just, it's going to take you 24 hours for DNS to really populate everything. So you may not yeah. be able to do this. We may have to come back on another day, Alonzo, yeah. and demonstrate that it works. Right. I'll, I'll do some testing. Sorry, guys, for the glitch, but I will uh, do some testing. And if you'd like, I'd more, be more than happy to create a video and put it in Slack for everyone to take a look at. Well, and it's not it's not just the people in Slack. So we can... Well, we can yeah. Why don't we do this, Alonzo? We'll take yeah. it offline. We'll give our DNS servers a chance to do it. Yeah. We'll create a video, you and me, on how to set this up. And we'll just release it on our YouTube channel. Because I don't want to hold people on a Saturday while we're troubleshooting <laughs> right. um, you know, DNS issues. All this stuff is going to happen if you do these kind of things. It's part of my life, part yeah. of everybody's life. Bill Gates demoed Windows 98 and the thing crashed on him. Um, <laughs> I've seen some demos like 20 years ago from Steve Jobs that also didn't work. Uh, live demos, you know, anything's happened. I got to tell you one time, and you guys may think this is funny. I was actually in Dubai. Um, we had we had designed this voice over this voice and video fiber to the home project back 20, 20 some years ago. When I got there, they're like, Mike, you're the multicast guru. Go solve this for me. I walk in and literally people are tracing electrons through the back plane of the switch. And I'm sitting there thinking, you want me to go fix this? Uh-oh. Uh and then out of nowhere, I was like, you know what? I noticed that's the most beautiful cards you have, the brand new ones. Let's take the old ones, plug it in, and it works. So, you know, things happen with demos. 25 years of demos, things are always going to happen. So, Alonzo, thank you for the demo. I still think we're running into a DNS server issue. And I think no it's all for everybody here to make a nice video and really help everybody about it, a video that we can do. Um, a take one, and if we have to do a take two, if we're arguing with DNS servers. But uh, Alonzo, appreciate everything you've done this week. I appreciate. It. Thanks so much, Mike. Yeah, just part of you know anybody that's ever done an ex demo, or everybody that's ever done an executive briefing, or all the folks on this call who one day will, will all experience this while doing a demo one time. So thank you guys for being supportive. <laughs> it is part of the job. I promise you. One day you're going to bring a team of 30 cloud engineers with you. Um, and you bring those teams of 30 cloud engineers with you. And uh, funny things are going to happen. So yeah, you know. I appreciate everyone's grace. That That's I really appreciate it. So, yeah, it's uh, it's at the foul line and I did not uh, get it in the bucket. <laughs> so no matter how much expertise you have in tech, Things will happen. No matter what you do in tech, things will happen. Why do you think I'm saying multi-cloud? It's mm. not because I don't think AWS is full of really great, smart people. They are. I know a lot of them. It's not that Azure isn't full of great, smart people. Azure got hacked last month. It's just part of life. Um, and and you know, no matter how much you prepare, tech does a mind of its own sometimes. So I've got seven, well, actually nine VMware ESXi servers in my house. All have the same E5 2670 V3 CPUs in them. All have 128 cores and all have two terabyte NVMe drives. And you know what? You install it on five of them. They all work. The sixth one, you basically got to take everything apart, pop it back in, and then all of a sudden it works. It's just part of the fun. So, you know. And Mike, um, yeah. we've had a couple of people ask how long the coupon code is good for. We will keep that 25% code active for the next two weeks. After those two weeks, it will not be active, and the 20% code that we typically provide will be active, but for the 25% code, um, it'll have a VF active for two weeks. For the people that have actually submitted to the contest, many of you have not submitted your email addresses to us. 
please do so. And we will email you a 30% off coupon if you participated in that contest. The people that participated in the context were the ones that created a post that had a certain thing that included the words hash cloud hired that included a link to um, our training course or this free training because we, we were permitting the free training. I'm super happy you passed your CCP. Um, thanks so much. Uh, wonderful. So happy to have you here, Daniel Green. Excuse me, Mike. Guess what? We got it running. We got it running now? Was it just the end let me share. Yeah. Yeah. Let's share. This is what happens with DNS, you know? Okay. Let's, uh, we're going to add, can you everyone see that? We're going to add that. There we go. We got our Apache Ubuntu default, default page. So we were able to set up that a record. Um, uh, as I was saying earlier, um, we set up a via Ubuntu, uh, virtual machine and we added Apache on top of that. We pinged it with uh, with the server IP pay, um, IP address, and now it's connected. So I'm glad I was able to complete uh, this lab for you guys successfully. Although we had a couple of bumps in the road, but I'm glad we were able to do that. When you're dealing with other stuff that has to propagate other stuff to other stuff to other stuff, or caches that could be timed out, that's when funny business happens. So Alonzo. <laughs> Great job. Thank you for doing this cloud engineering work for us this week. I know you're mostly a designer like me. I know I designed. I knew you would get it done. I was still thinking it would take a couple more hours for DNS to propagate across the yeah. internet. But you know what? We got there. That's all that really matters. So we gotta, we, we gotta do it on the fly, man. We we can't quit. We gotta always look for that answer. We gotta provide the answers. Um and when I don't have them, um I have I have my mentor. Mike and and Chris, you know, he doesn't want to talk about the things that he can do, but you know, he's a superhero in his own right as well. So it's he good. To be, so, yes, it's good to be surrounded by quality, intelligent people that I can learn from, and that we as a community can as well. Thank you, Alonzo. I have a philosophy. When I build a team, I hire people smarter than me. Every time, I hire people that are going to tell me what I don't want to hear. Every time, Mike, don't do this, Mike. Do this, Mike, the 50 presentations you thought you could do by tomorrow, you can't. So it's what it takes. Alonzo, excellent job. You're talking to a mute button, um, no, which no, I do all the time no, as well. No, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm here. It's not me. Okay. So you're here. Wall's good. So everyone, again, thank you for participating in the AWS Certified Solution Architect 2022 course. Abu Nasser, um, we will keep that coupon for the 25% off valid for two weeks. Um, after uh, the third, we will also administer a 30 30% uh, coupon to anybody that participated in the contest. Chris from my team apparently knows who all they are because he keeps track of everyone. And because he did that, he will send 30% coupon codes off to anybody that did it. Alonzo, I definitely, definitely appreciate you coming in here with the cape as the superhero. <laughs> kind of configuring and setting all this stuff up for us. Real grateful for all of you folks that are out there. We truly love you. We want to do everything we can to help you. I want to let you know that on Monday, we're going to have our free how to get your first cloud architect job webinar. First thing in the morning, we'll tell you everything to do to get your first cloud architect job, what you need to know, what employers care about, all of it. After that, Monday afternoon, we will do free question and answer sessions, anything related to cloud computing careers. On Tuesday, we don't have anything. On Wednesday next week, we will do a free how to get your first cloud architect, or we will do a completely free um, question and answer session. On Thursday, we will have a how to get your first architect job session live on Zoom, where you can ask questions, of course. On Friday, we will bring in Praveen, who's a working cloud architect. He was one of my students, and he's a fantastic student, but he has 20 plus years experience in data, big data environments. And now he's working as a cloud big data architect after running through our program. But also, he had huge amounts of great big data experience in the past. And it's that big data experience that we want to share with you. Remember, it takes a team. It takes a village. Assemble the best people on your team. There's nothing you can achieve. So thank you so much. It's been such an honor. If you haven't hit the like button, please do so. If you're not a member of our channel, please uh, subscribe and hit the bell. Um, we, we, uh, so you can be informed of a lot of the new free services that we're going to be doing coming very soon. Lots of them. You'll be notified them if you've subscribed and hit the bell. 
next week. Thank you all so much. Um, and thank you again, Mike, for having me. Thank you for everyone for taking the time to be patient. And I hope that I was able to help you with uh, continued learning. Join the community. Be a part of the community. If you are a part of the community, be more active. Raise your hand. Um, help one another. Support one another. Um, create projects and, and grow together. This is an awesome community to be a part of. And thank you again for Mike for having me. And thanks, Chris, again, for everything you have, you helped me with as well. Alonzo, thank you so much. Chris, thank you so much for, for putting up with me, calling you at two o'clock in the morning. Hey, Chris, can we do this? Or, hey, Chris, is this going to work? Hey, Chris, can we stream to 50 different media streams at the same time? This is what Chris has to contend with for me. I am a hyperactive, bounce off the walls executive with about 20 years of experience doing these same kind of thing. So let's all thank Chris for helping to orchestrate and make sure this works and keeping me on track and even reminding me when I have to be in certain places at certain times. So thank you, Chris. I was talking to Chris about having a behind the scenes edition. I think that would be uh, awesome. <laughs> Actually, one day we should do it. It would be a best comedy. Hey, Chris, can I be in England, Nigeria, and Dubai all at the same time? And he's like, be a Zoomer in person. <laughs> exactly. I think they would get a kick out of it, especially Chris. <laughs> Love it. I think Chris would be able to fi finally figure out a way to get me to go from Legos to Athens to Dubai all at the same time. He's probably, if anybody could figure it out, it would be Chris. Indeed. <laughs> so thank Mike, you, you have something you have something you have to do, Mike. <laughs> I do have some, please. I actually yes. do. I have physical therapy. I know, that's why I said it. In 20 minutes. So thank you for reminding me to go to physical therapy for my bad hand and my bad foot. Take care, everyone. It's been such Take an care. honor and a privilege to have you all here today. Take care, everybody.